so thank you very much for spending your Friday evening with me. Um, it helps that there's eight whiskeys to try. Um, so hopefully we'll have a pleasant night trying some of the whiskeys. Um, I suggest you maybe don't drink them all in one sitting. I mean, you're in your own home. I can't really tell you what to do. Um, but uh, it might be that you, you kind of just take this hour and a half to, to learn about them and then enjoy them over the course of several evenings, not just one. But you're all adults and you're absolutely free to, to do whatever you do. Um, so we will get started. Um, I'm going to go through, this is the, the running order of the tasting. So there'll be a quick introduction, uh, then a talk about who Weems Malts are as brands. Then we'll do a quick Q&A, mainly based on the brands, um, and then we'll jump into each one of the whiskies. And then it's just a quick five, ten minutes talking about each of the whiskies and really trying to figure out what it is, whether it's production, maturation, that's really making this whiskey distinctive and stand out. Because, you know, that's the kind of uh, the, where I find the most interest. And as a whiskey blender, we try and identify the, 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 the specific characteristics of the production that's, that's making that spirit taste the way it does so that we can look to recreate, swap it out, that kind of thing. Um, so we'll go through those eight whiskies uh, through the course of the tasting, and then we'll have a second Q&A. So if anybody has any particular questions that they've, they've got from the course of the whole tasting, they can ask that afterwards as well. Um, so I'll just fire into it. So first thing, the most obvious thing, it comes up all the time. I actually saw um, an article a couple of days ago about 10 uh, mispronounced names in Scotch whiskey. Uh, it might be distilleries such as Brookladdy or Puna Harbin, but Weems is a common one because people get it a little bit wrong. Uh, it's an old Gaelic name, an old Scottish name. Uh, so the, the Y and the extra S in there seems to confuse people a little bit. So simplest thing is Weems, Weems Malts, it's pronounced Weems. It's not called Wimeses, it's not called Wimeses, uh, Wimeses, it's Wimes. So if you get that right, uh, you're, you're doing better than a lot of people. Um, so yeah, it's called Wimes. And uh, what it is, it's the Scots word for caves. So the Wimes family um, are actually a offshoot, offshoot of the Macduffs. And the Macduffs are, uh, again, a kind of ancient Scottish family who fought in the Scottish War of Independence, um, but not on the winning side. So after Robert Bruce won, um, there was kind of uh, issues with that family and um, they had a kind of medieval rebrand and that section of the Macduffs changed their name and they just changed it to the name of caves. Uh, the castle, the Wien's castle is on a cliff in Fife um, and there's lots of caves uh, perforated into the rocks. So they kind of unimaginatively just took the name of the nearest thing to them, the caves uh, uh, next to the castle. So that's where the name Weems comes from. Uh, the family it has its historical connections in Fife, um, just uh, across the, the Forth River from Edinburgh. Um, if we're in whiskey region terminology, it's, it's Lowlands. Um, and really, uh, although we're, we're based in Fife, uh, uh, the families from Fife, Operationally, we are based in Edinburgh. Uh, I'm here in Edinburgh. Uh, our office is in Edinburgh. Um, we do most of our sampling, tasting panels, office work in the office in the West End of Edinburgh. And then when it comes to uh, vatting, blending, bottling, bringing casks uh, to a site, um, that is an area called Broxburn that's just outside of Edinburgh. If you're familiar with distilleries such as uh, Glen Farkless, um, Glen Goyne Distillery, um, Edinburgh Gin, um, they're all bottled at that same facility, and uh, that's where we tend to do our, our bottling as well. Um, right, so the Weems connections to whiskey, it goes back uh, for a few different things. Um, Fife as a region, a lot of the east coast of uh, Scotland is a kind of prime location for growing barley. Uh, good quality Scottish barley that has low amount of nitrogen that's, that's perfect uh, for high yielding uh, cereals. Sorry, one second, my phone is going off. <laughs> Colleagues calling me during the tasting. Anyway, so yeah, east coast of Scotland, a uh, perfect area for growing barley, and Weems has a lot of land there. Uh, so a lot of kind of freeholding farms back in uh, you know, a couple of hundred years ago. So those lands, the supply of barley was always used for whiskey distillation. Then a little bit later, um, the Weems land around Leven in Fife 
um, that was sold to John Haig, and that's where they expanded and built um, the grain distillery, Cameron Bridge. There was all, already a smaller distillery there, but that's where this huge expansion, and really, Fife is a great little window to look through the industrialization of whiskey through the Victorian era. So, you know, you start as kind of farm steading illicit distillation. And then by the end of the 19th century, you're up to kind of giant mega distilleries and continuous stills. And a huge amount of that innovation happened in Fife between two Scottish families, the Higgs and the Steins. The Higgs you might still know of because there's, a, there's the Higg Club brand, uh, part of the Argeo that, that still retains that name. But the Steins have kind of been lost to time. Um, and they were really, uh, they were kind of, some historians talk about whiskey gangsters. Uh, they do very odd things. They would, uh, they would buy land uh, up north of a distillery and kind of divert the water source. So it cut off the water support, the source of their uh, competitor. And then they would buy the distillery. Uh, they would give out very kind of uh, dodgy loans uh, to competitors and then basically bankrupt them. Um, they also did that to their own family members. So the Higgs and the Steins kind of warred with each other. And that's where we saw this kind of huge kind of uh, innovation of whiskey distillation, grain pot stills, using canals, using trains um, to kind of run the, um, uh, the, the distribution uh, around that area. Um, so, yeah, it all kind of happened in Fife. Um, and it, it's great now um, to see that Fife's coming a little bit more of a, a region. Again, um, it's part of the lowlands, but a few years back, there was, there was almost no distilleries left. Uh, and now we're, we're at five single malt distilleries and the largest grain distillery in Europe, which is Cameron Bridge Distillery, produces over 100 million litres of mutual grain and uh, whiskey grain spirit. Um, and that that's, was originally built on the Weems land. So that's the kind of historical connections over the last couple of hundred years that have uh, tied Weems to whiskey. However, it wasn't really until kind of 2002 where William Weems, who is my boss, uh, the director of the company, um, William's father has a winery in France called Rumoresque. So we have various sales agents in France who sell uh, uh, Provence Rosé wine uh, with a kind of Scottish family emblem on it, and it's a Scottish company. Uh, so French uh, caviste shop owners kind of always wondered, well, you know, you're a Scottish family, you produce wine, where's the whiskey? Uh, so that's where that kind of seed of the idea about whether the Weems family should get into whiskey production, uh, came into things. And it was in 2005 that William officially set up the company. Uh, he worked with a few people uh, to kind of help advise, which I'll, I'll get into in a minute. Um, and what he really did was kind of, he wanted to take the same principles of uh, wine blending and see that through into scotch production. Um, we did bottle a couple of single cast whiskies, uh, the likes of which we're going to be trying tonight. But the main thing was about blending, uh, not blended scotch, blended malt so just taking quality distinctive uh single malts and carefully combining them together to get to really unique flavors you'll see uh, if I get my big head out the way um we've got hive spice king peach chimney and that's our kind of core range of whiskey uh we produce i think we've got 11 different blended malts right now on the market um, and that's really the, the mainstay of our business. So tonight's something quite unique for us, something a little bit more special, where we're just trying uh, some of our single cask, single malt whiskies. Um, we bottle probably about 60 a year. Sometimes if we push it, we'll go up to 70. Um, so in terms of scale of an independent bottler for single cask, that really squarely puts us in the kind of, uh, the, the smaller of the independent bottlers were not really at kind of, Gordon McPhail or Scotch Malt Whiskey Society scales where they're producing 500 single casks a year. Uh, our, our focus is primarily on the blending, but you know, when we do get hold of unusual parcels of casks or we have some casks that are in stock uh, maturing um, and we'll pull them out for tasting, then we, we will look at bottling single cask whiskies. Um, so William is the head of the company and you'll see on the picture there to the right, that is uh, Isabella, that's William's sister. So while William's the director of the company, um, Isabella is, uh, in head, is, is basically in charge of logistics coordination. She is sourcing new make spirit. She is sourcing casks from Spain, from America. Um, she is buying uh, already mature casks of whiskey or whiskies that have got a couple of years on them, but we need to put into warehousing again for a little bit longer. So a huge amount of the logistical sourcing of our whiskey and ultimately the bottling 
um, is done by Isabella. And then Charlie McLean, that some of you may know if you are fairly into the kind of whiskey scene. Um, we work very, very closely with Charlie McLean. We have since day one. Uh, so when William was looking for these kind of consultants or people to help him, because uh, by his own admission, William didn't know a lot about whiskey. Uh, he wanted to work with the best and, and find the right people. Um, Charlie is a kind of gun for hire in the whiskey industry. You know, he could be working for us one day, working for Diageo the next. Um, but really what it comes down with Charlie is he has t two very good things. Um, he, has, he has an excellent nose and kind of a vocabulary in terms of describing whiskey. And then uh, I think the thing that, that I find most outstanding with him is just his historical knowledge of whiskey. And anytime you get a, an article written by Charlie McLean, it's incredibly well researched and uh, very, very uh, knowledgeable stuff. Um, so Charlie, he, he started with the Whiskey Research uh, Institute um, just uh, close to where Glen Kinchy is outside of Edinburgh. And really where he came into the limelight is he helped design the terminology, the, the vocabulary that we use to describe uh, aroma and flavor in whiskey. Um, so, you know, back, I can show you on the next slide here, um, back in the day, back in the 70s and 80s, what we have here in this diagram, this is a pretty nuts and bolts industry standard um, flavor wheel. And what it really is, it's, it's called a concentration test. Now, I'm sure you guys go to tastings and write your own little tasting notes and compare and debate. But when you actually properly analyze whiskey um, for, uh, for, for, for production, for selection, um, you go through three different stages uh, of analysis and testing. First thing you do is a difference test. So you take, um, you wouldn't just take, you know, whiskey one, whiskey two blind and see if you can smell the difference. What you'd actually do is you take two of the same sample and then one that's different and all you all you have to do in that test is identify which is the different whiskey uh, the reason that you're doing that is uh, basically if you're making batches year on year i mean that could be for whiskey it could be for beer it could be for tomato ketchup you need to make sure you're keeping consistency year on year on year so a difference test is a, a very very important test this wheel on the left, uh, this is what's called a concentration test. So once you have selected your whiskey, um, you can maybe pick out different styles. Oh, there's, there's vanilla in there, there's smoke, but actually how much, what's the concentration? So you can see a score. I mean, it's marked at three there, but there's actually up to six. Uh, we tend to do it up to five. Um, and that's really to understand the concentration and intensity of flavor, um, especially, you know, if we had 10 casks from one distillery, it's all the same vintage, all the same cask type, but you really need to start identifying how are those casks different, depending on you might use them for blending or for bottling single cask. A concentration test is the most vital thing uh, to really kind of start differentiating them. So what Charlie did is he kind of came into this with the Pentland Whiskey Research Institute, saw this concentration test, and then looked to develop it into something that's, to put my marketing head on, uh, a little bit more consumer facing. Uh, so it's actually just kind of exploding the terminology uh, uh, of how we describe whiskey. And this is uh, what happened here with uh, Charlie's Whiskey Wheel, which you can buy now, and there's all sorts of flavor wheels, and you can get coffee flavor wheels and wine flavor wheels and all sorts right now. And, and this is one of the earliest that I've seen. And he separated out into eight different specific flavor styles that kind of come from different parts of the production. So grainy, we're just talking about the kind of cereal malt base. Grassy, that's actually aldehydes that develop in fermentation. Fragrant could be a variety of different things from aldehydes to esters to other compounds. Uh, same with fruity, peaty, that's coming from the, the, the peaty uh, barley and smoke. Wood is obviously the cask influence and then a few other things there. Uh, off notes is quite an interesting one we might talk about later. So he, he turns a kind of industrial terminology into the way that we describe whiskey now. And we really took that to heart with Weems. We're not the only ones to do it, but um, you, you will see that all of our whiskies, as well as having kind of... Uh, Descriptive tasting notes, we always have a flavor-led name, whether it's a single cask or a blended malt, uh, we always use that. Um, I've got Anders raising his hands. Is that to ask a question? Um, I might just, Anders, I'll get you to hold on that, and in two minutes' time, I'll do a quick Q&A. Uh, uh, that way we can just um, keep, keep the tasting on track, if that's okay. Thank you. 
Uh, oh, there we go, Q and A. <laughs> right. So um, let's see. I can. There's a little Q and A panel, so people can write in there if they like. If they've got any particular questions, just to start with uh, about the brand, or um, I'd probably not even fully introduce myself. Um, I'm not Ben Stewart, as it's seen on the screen. My name's actually Stephen Shand. Um, I'm the, the blender, the brand manager for Weems Malts, um, but one of the key jobs that I have is working in the tasting panel. Um, so, you know, Charlie and Isabella, they will get cast samples. I would love to say we have a big boardroom and do a tasting panel of eight, 10 people. But in reality, uh, what Charlie and Isabella do is they go out for a nice long two, three hour lunch with maybe 20, 30 cast samples. And then Isabella comes back and goes, right, these are the ones that we're bottling. Here's some notes from Charlie. Here's a score from Charlie, one to 10. That's the final part of those three testing elements that we were talking about. And that's called a preferential, uh, preferential test. Uh, so it's which do you prefer and why? So a score out of one to 10 and the tasting notes. So that comes to me uh, and I will work with uh, some of the team that might be some of the sales team, some of the other marketing team and a few other people. And we will develop uh, a full tasting note for each of the single casks. And then we kind of, excuse the pun, distill it down to one particular name. And that's the names that we use to refer to our whiskies. Um, right. I will see if anybody does want to ask a question, fire it into the question and answers box or um, raise your hand and I will unmute you. Uh, so I'll see if I can find Anders and unmute him and see if he had something to say or if he just accidentally pressed a button on his keyboard. Uh, where where would Anders be? Oh, no, I can't even see him. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, so it doesn't look like I'm getting any questions from anybody. So I will move on if that's okay. Uh, right, one second. So um, I'm not going to go through, uh, you'll be pleased to know, the full kind of uh, beginning to end of production on whiskey. Um, if you've got any specific questions, oh, Q&A has popped up. Ah, I've got a few questions here, so I'll quickly uh, answer questions. First one uh, is, are you wearing pants? <laughs> yes. <laughs> And the second one is, do you usually bottle single casks at a high age? Um, yes, essentially. Um, we've kind of got a rule right now that we're not going to bottle any Weems malt under the age of 12. We've done a couple before, um, but we like to kind of have a benchmark in quality. I'm, I'm not saying that 12 is the magic number where all whiskey is excellent. Um, there's much younger whiskey that can be great as well. It's just a kind of decision we made with some of our single casks. And really, it's dependent on your stocks. So right now, we have quite a large quantity of uh, single cast stock that's 20 years plus. Um, but we do have maturing other whiskies that are um, coming up of age. We're not too dissimilar from a lot of other independent bottlers where the real kind of gap in stock is teenage stock, uh, kind of 13 to 18, 19 years old. Um, just you know that that's you going back to a time where there was a real squeeze on production and whiskey got very very popular so there wasn't large large stock quantities but it, it's kind of fixing itself and we're starting to get more stock again so really i mean the answer is right now we have old stock but next year the year after we'll probably have some younger releases as well as the older stuff um, but today's a real treat i mean i think we've got one 12 year old but then everything else is at least 22 years and older. Um, so it's, it's a great tasting for uh, older whiskey. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions. Oh, one more from Mel. Do you think age often translates into a better taste experience? Uh, I mean, you put the word often in there, uh, which yes, often it can, but I'm, I'm not of the opinion that old just, equals better um, as a blender different ages actually open up different types of flavor uh, if I wanted to say make a very very smoky whiskey um, or what to be economical with the amount of smoky whiskey that I'm going to put into a blend because uh, smoky whiskey is more expensive use young whiskey 
maybe not three years old, but five year old, you get really, really heavy smoke. Um, and if you just flick, met, have that by itself, it might be a little bit too harsh because it's, it's quite young, but very smoky. But if you then blend that, offset that with some 12 year olds and 15 year olds, you get all the power of the smoke and then some of the, the more mature notes coming through. Uh, the other flavor that's good young is bright esters, as I kind of describe them. So it's a kind of raspberry, um, fresh apple kind of aroma. Uh, and that's very, very vibrant. You know, you can smell that mimic, but it's maybe a little bit unrefined. Um, that's very, very f vibrant from kind of six to eight years old. And then depending on the distillery and the cask, it can kind of dip down. Uh, adversely to that, I've also had very old whiskies where I've sat on tasting panels with different companies. I had 46 year olds and you know, the, the, the thing's dark, dark treacle in color. You smell it. It's strawberries and raspberries, just lovely complex leathery notes. You think it's going to be amazing. And then you taste it and it's acrid and bitter. Uh, and what's happened is in that kind of balance of spirit to wood, so wood is just completely overtaken and, and collapsed it. And yeah, it can be such an off-putting flavor that actually damages your palate for uh, the rest of the night. Um, so, so age isn't always better. And, and sometimes some of the older whiskeys, um, my, my, my friend Olaf described it once as it finds its chair. You know, it just kind of sits down and it's just like an old person in a chair. It's not really moving around. It's just kind of leathery and flabby <laughs> and oxidized. Um, it, it can kind of lose its interest. Um, whereas, you know, a younger whiskey, like a younger person's a little bit more vibrant and active. Um, so it, it, age, age is a lot more complex and it, it, it depends on the distillery. It depends, it depends so much more on the cask. Is the cask brand new first fill or is it on its fourth fill? There's a, there's a lot more going on with age. You can't just put a, a magic number on there. Um, so, uh, if I end up asking that question, um, how do you have 20 year old whiskey when your company is only 15 years old because we buy older whiskey? So you don't just, um, actually it's very hard to start a new whiskey company, buy a new make spirit and buy empty casks. It's a lot of money there. There's a lot of expertise required in finding the right people, um, getting the contacts for, to be able to buy bulk new make spirit, uh, having a facility to fill it. So actually an independent bottler, the first thing they will do is they will buy casks of mature whiskey. So in 2005, William and Isabella would have been buying 10-year-old, 15-year-old, 20-year-old casks, but they would have also been filling their own a couple of years later. Um, so it's, it's actually pretty common for uh, an independent bottler to buy whiskey that's older than, than their own company. Uh, so that's answers. Um, do you have a favorite single cask that you have released? Uh, yes, my favorite is a 35-year-old, so it was older. Um, but it, it had the right kind of balance. It's called Smoky Nectar, and it was a 35-year-old Kalila from Isla, and Kalila's my favorite uh, Scottish distillery to, to generalize. Uh, I just think almost any expression I've had of Kalila from five years old to 35 years old has always really interested me, and it's the first whiskey that really kind of triggered my uh, what's called the lambic, uh, limbic system, uh, which triggers memory. Uh, so when a particular aroma or smell uh, really fires something from your childhood back up. And um, it's just that smell of kind of cut slate, uh, kind of concretely dusty, earthy smoke. And that just reminds me of growing up in Cumbria where the, the slate mines and my dad used to cut them with angle grinders. And I just really, really love that distinct smell. Uh, so yeah, smoky nectar was always my favorite. Uh, how did you start your career in whiskey? Uh, well, like all whiskey people, I have a degree in visual communication and animation. Um, but then somehow ended up in whiskey. Um, I guess I just started working in bars around about 2008, nine. Uh, there weren't a lot of jobs going in animation straight after the financial crash. Um, so I didn't want to just work in kind of normal uh, spit and sawdust ale pubs the whole time. Um, so I decided to kind of specialize a little bit more. And for some reason with whiskey, it just st stuck in my head. You know, I could just remember dates and region and, and production things. And I just found to have a, a kind of good passion and strength for it. So I uh, went from working in kind of standard bars to then working for a company called the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society at the vaults. I actually lived in the vaults uh, for a while um, and I was there for about four or five years. Then I opened up uh, backing of um, 
uh, Edinburgh family, I opened up a whiskey shop on the Royal Mile. Um, and then I kind of was a bit of a freelance consultant for independent uh, whiskey and Scottish spirits producers. And then I joined Weems about four years ago as a, a brand assistant, then as brand manager. Then when we look to start kind of internally producing and blending our whiskey, uh, that's where I kind of stepped up. I had a good understanding of production and where kind of aroma and flavor developed from and kind of stepped into the role of the blender uh, for Weems malts as well. Uh, so yeah, that's my a kind of shortened version of how I got into it. So uh, I think that's a few questions answered and we're already running a bit late. So let's actually just start tasting some whiskey, I think. Um, so I'll skip through some of this. Uh, we'll come back to it later on. Uh, we're going to jump into whiskey number one, uh, which we have called Triptych of Treats. Now, the reason we called it Triptych of Treats is um, when we did our first tastings. Um, this is actually my folder for tasting panel notes. Um, you can see there the way we kind of break it up. We have the slot number, the color of the whiskey, the nose or aroma. Then we have the taste. We split that into three parts. We have the beginning, the mid, and the end. Uh, so that's the kind of the journey of the flavor. You know, you don't just drink it and it's just apples and pears the whole time. The flavor will shift and change uh, as it sits on your tongue and then even once you've swallowed it. And that's the kind of flavor journey. So yeah, we do beginning, middle, end. Uh, I always talk about body in whiskey. Uh, you'll see that on the diagram. Um, it's uh, referred to as mouthfeel. I think it's something that's not talked about enough in whiskey, often enough. Um, and different parts of production really create different uh, mouthfeels and style. Uh, depth of sweetness is another one. Um, all whiskey is sweet, but some is sweeter than others. And then it's, it's not just it's sweet, it's what type of sweetness. Is it a uh, very refined white sugar sweetness? Or are you right up to honey? Or something more sophisticated and into kind of treacle and molasses? So, you know, there's a, there's a depth to sweetness. So that kind of needs to be thought about as, as well. That's our initial flavor wheel, which eventually ends up uh, on these tasting notes. And then we have our name suggestions. Um, so that's kind of how we approach doing uh, these tasting notes and tasting panels. Um, sorry, but my, my answer <laughs> to uh, why we call it Triptych of Treats is uh, the three major things that we kind of uh, drew from this whiskey um, was the kind of really intense uh, fruity estuary character. Uh, a very peppery, spicy note, and then uh, more of the kind of vanilla, creamy, butterscotchy, diacetyl notes, uh, which part of which comes from fermentation, the other part's coming from the wood maturation. So you can see on the diagram here, the vanilla is kind of representing that butterscotchy note, the citrus and the rich fruit, that's that deep kind of estuary, fruity character. Uh, we've also got some nice uh, floral notes um, and uh, the, the big kind of peppery spice as well. So we can kind of already make some guesses with this whiskey. The, the cask is, is, is doing, a, doing a decent job. You know, we're getting decent spice levels. We're getting the vanilla and we're getting the butterscotch coming through. Um, I, I'm going to maybe shock you with the amount of water that I put into these whiskeys. Uh, I have tasted these before. I'm keeping some to taste, but... Blending uh, or my kind of approach for whiskey is I add a lot of water because I'm, I'm nosing it. And when you add a lot of water, you're going to take off the alcohol burn, but you're stress testing the whiskey. The first time I worked with blenders, uh, Norman Matheson and John, John Glass, um, they sat me down and they diluted all of these cash strength whiskeys down to 20%. And it just absolutely shocked me. But we weren't there to drink them. You know, if a blender drinks all the samples, <laughs> uh, they're just, they're not going to be able to do their job. And actually your nose is, is much more of a refined tool for getting uh, more complexity and aroma. So I am going to dilute this down probably to about 20, 30% ABV. And that means that I can really get all of the detail and nuance that's coming out of the whiskey. Um, but I've got to keep on track. So I'm not really going to be drinking these through the course of the night or we, we uh, well, I might not get to the end. Um, but yeah, the, the big thing for me with this is the first note is just this lovely kind of grassy uh, floral note. And this distillery, Linkwood, is owned by Diageo. And Diageo, uh, what they used to do is talk, they still, they still do a bit, they, they talk about their new make spirits, the unmatured whiskey, uh, the unmatured spirit before it goes into cask. And they grouped it into six different flavor profiles. And that was to really assist their blenders in understanding uh, what distilleries are producing, what kind of style of spirit. And Linkwood uh, really squarely fits into their first category, which they call grassy. 
uh, grassy whiskey, um, a lot of lowland whiskies. Uh, our own distillery, King's Barns, has a kind of grassy notes uh, distillery such as Ockentoshan. But you'll find grassiness in Highland whiskies and Speyside whiskies. It's, it's not specific to one region. Um, it kind of develops um, the, the what you call aldehydes to develop in the fermentation process. And really, the, the longer you leave those, uh, those, um, those washbacks to ferment, the more you can build up this grassy characteristic. Same with esters, which is the fruit character. So Linkwood, to me, um, is a Speyside whiskey. It really sits squarely in that just kind of Speyside fruit, grassy kind of uh, just straight down the middle Speyside whiskey. Um, there's not a lot of uh, big brand releases from Linkwood. Uh, they've got what's called the Flora and Fauna. I think it's a 12 year olds, if I remember correctly. And you'll see them occasionally once a year do a limited edition. Um, but for independent bottlers and for blenders, we really cherish Linkwoods. And, you know, we're not, we're not going to be able to get hold of Macallans and Glenfarquhases every single day, these kind of mega brands. Um, and Linkwood is a little bit of a kind of unsung hero. Um, and mainly it's because it's kept blending. Uh, it features in a huge amount of blended scotches uh, that are out there. Even, even uh, blends that aren't owned by its parent company, Diageo, blends that are owned by Bacardi, um, they, will, they will use Linkwood. They will buy casks of it and blend because it's just such a quality Speyside whiskey with these really bright, fruity, grassy notes. But then you can see the cask influence coming in, or you can smell the cask influence coming in. Uh, we're, what, up to 22, 23 years old. Um, I would guess, we don't have this information when, when we did the tasting panel, but I would guess this is the second fill cask. If it was first fill, I would expect really, really intense, intense vanilla, um, but it, it's not up to that full scale. You can see from the flavor wheel, it's a little bit milder. Um, so yeah, I, I would guess that this cask has been used um, obviously once in, uh, in Kentucky and then once in Scotland, and then this is its second filling, if I had to guess. Um, and then after over 20 years, um, we've come down to natural cash strength of 47%, which is, is quite low. Um, it, it's quite surprising, but that, that can happen um, from maybe leaking of casks or just depending on where it's placed into the warehouse. Really the wild card with whiskey, you know, you can, you can plan production and, and design a distillery and you can even kind of source your casks. But once you put that spirit into a cask, that's where this kind of wild card magic element comes in. And, you know, you could have on a spreadsheet 20 Linkwoods, uh, 23 years old in second floor bourbon casks. But until you crack them open and before you do those concentration tests, you're just not going to know the, the full scale of, of what's happened there. And if one's got much more vanilla or much more grassy notes. And that's, that's the beauty of single cask whiskey. And that, that's what we've got here tonight is just all these unique whiskies that you know it might end up tasting a little bit like the commercial release it might be something completely foreign uh, to what you would normally expect and, and that that's the, the joyous thing with single cask whiskey um and yeah i think triptych treats is just a good light fresh whiskey to get started on although it's cash strength we're only at 47 percent, so we're not kind of blowing your socks off with a 65 percent whiskey right at the beginning um, and there's a good cask influence coming in. Uh, that's that peppery spiciness. And then that's all those kind of vanilla butterscotchy notes as well. So great whiskey. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let myself have a little taste, even though it's only kind of 30%. Yeah, I diluted it too much for drinking. <laughs> but yeah, I use my nose. You guys can, can taste and enjoy. Right. Um, Oh, I'll quickly show you there. Um, so Linkwood Distillery, you can see maybe one of the reasons it's not a mega brand um, is it kind of looks, you know, it's not the most attractive of buildings. It looks a little bit like my secondary school. Um, it's got what I uh, refer to in the industry as a car showroom uh, still house. So you can see these big windows at the front. Um, this was quite common with United Distillers um, and what they did um, rather brutally in the 60s and 70s is a lot of their distilleries, um, they knocked down the still house in many of the buildings and they, they built and expanded. So they went from maybe two pot stills up to four pot stills or six pot stills. And they kind of used this kind of uh, replicable uh, design. Um, so Linkwood has it, uh, Klein Leash Distillery, which we'll be looking at later on, that has that same showroom. And then as I said earlier, my favorite distillery, uh, Kalila, this also has a showroom setup 
the difference with Kalila is rather than just being in a car park, it's hanging off the side of a cliff on an island. So it's just amazing to see that that building is is there. Like, how did they build it? And even today, you know, there's there's a tiny little winding road going down to it. You can't get a truck. You can't you can't deliver barley on a truck. You can't pick up new make on a truck. So they actually have pipes and feeds going to the top of the hill, um, and that's where they uh, supply uh, the raw ingredients in and uh, and the spirit out. Um, but yeah, this kind of car showroom style. It's not the prettiest, uh, but it, it serves its function. Um, the main couple of things I want to talk about production with Linkwood, I won't spend too long with it, is really, um, as I said earlier, to get this kind of grassy note and esters, you've got to have long fermentation times. And you can see there in my production notes, uh, we're 65 to 105 hours in fermentation. Now that seems wildly variable, but what it actually means is that shows that they work or the staff aren't around at the weekend. So Monday to Friday, 60, 65 hour three-day fermentation times, but then Friday, they clock off, but the, the, the fermentations are still running Saturday, Sunday. So that's the 105 hours. So they've got short fermentations of 65 hours and then some longer fermentations of 105 hours. Then they get distilled and it all gets vatted together. So they've actually got two different warts we call uh, the, the, the fermented beer and hot beer um, that they're distilling. And then um, you can see that the stills uh, at the bottom there are fairly normal shaped stills, uh, straight kind of uh, necks, but they're very large. Um, they've, they've got a lot of copper contact to them and actually quite unusual for a distillery. The second still is bigger than the first still. So usually your wash still is much bigger than your spirit still is smaller. That's because with distillation, we call it, uh, we work on something called uh, the rule of threes or the rule of thirds. And from every part of the production, you essentially cut the volume of liquid by a third. So your spirit still doesn't need to be bigger. The spirit still could be a third smaller and be able to distill all the spirit. But by having that larger still, you are increasing the amount of copper contact and you're also creating much more space for vapor to develop. And that's what's helping create this really crisp, lighter style. And it's, it's quite a common thing to see uh, in lighter styles of whiskey they will achieve much more copper contact, be it larger stills, not filling the stills as much, taller stills. There's, there's all sorts of different ways of achieving it, um, which we can talk about a little bit there as well. So that is triptych of treats. Um, before I jump on to the next one, just double check if there's any other answers, uh, any other questions. Uh, why are they all so light in color Older whiskies are often darker. So why are they all light in color? Firstly, they're in a wee bottle. <laughs> so you're not going to see 70 cl's worth of liquid um, given it its full color. Um, but probably the main reason is we're not using any first fill casks here. Uh, you've got whiskies that are all over 20 years old, save for the last one. We put these in first fill casks very active wood, maybe some of the original liquid of sherry or, or, or pot still in there, you would end up with a really, really concentrated, intense whiskey. And what happens is the spirit character collapses. Absolutely fine if you enjoy a sweet, treacly, rich style of drink. But for me, when you'll see from the presentation, where, where my interest comes is from spirit character. And I, I actually think it's a bit of a shame that you know, I, I enjoy a heavily sherry whiskey. Um, I do think that they serve their purpose. But if you really want to get into detail, nuance, understanding of the spirit style, then refill casks are king. That's where you really get to understand the nuances. Yes, they're not as sweet, but should we be reaching for the cookie jar all the time? No, we should maybe take a step back and look at some of these more refined styles. And that's where I find uh, you get that from refill casks, get that balance of wood and spirit. Um, so yeah, it, it's mainly because they're all in, in refill casks. Um, all whiskies are often darker and that you've got to be really careful with. It's not so much that they're darker. If you go to, if you get a chance to go to visitor centers, distilleries, and uh, you'll see they sometimes have bottles and they'll have 18 months, three years, five years, 10 years, blah, 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 blah. Actually, the majority of the color of a whiskey comes out in its first three years, sometimes even less. 
um, tree plants here are distillery, that's the first sort of bourbon cask at three years old. If that whiskey's 10 years old, then I'm not expecting a giant jump up in color. It actually, a lot of it comes out in the first few years. The reason is this misconception that all the whiskey is darker is that all the whiskey is more expensive. And that means that they tend to use the same sherry casks for all the whiskeys. So if you took a core range and I won't name any names, and if you looked at a 12 year old, a 15 year old, and an 18 year old in their core ranges, I almost guarantee the older they are, the darker they are. But it's got nothing to do with the age. Those older expressions are using sherry casks, where the uh, younger expressions are tending to use the cheaper sherry casks. So it's not as, as with everything in whiskey, it's not as simple as older is darker or older is better or younger is worse. There's so much else going on there. So yeah, it's, it's not, not always that simple. Um, Matt Nielsen is asking cask type hogshead. So that is 500 litre bourbon hogshead, right? Close, but not cigar. It is a bourbon hogshead, likely, um, but they are not 500 litres. That's a but. Uh, hogsheads are 250 litres. Uh, you have a barrel. 200 liters, uh, then you can cannibalize one out of 10 barrels and make uh, nine hogsheads, which are 250 liters. Uh, and you can tell they're bourbon. Well, I'll, I'll quickly jump ahead and I'll, I'll show you. You can see on this diagram here. So you've got the American standard barrel, ASB, 200 liters. Then next to it, you've got American hogshead. You can tell that this hogshead has been built from barrels because it's the same height. So they've, when they've shipped the barrels from America, they've broken them down and then rebuilt them at Cooperages in Scotland into what's called a hogshead. Hogshead's an old British uh, term for uh, a beer cask. Um, there's actually less hogsheads these days than there were 20 years ago. And that's because it's now cheaper to send barrels from America unbroken down. They take up more space. But it's still cheaper to do that than employ a cooper in Scotland to rebuild them. So the old American hogsheads, it'll still be around, but it's declined in quantity. There's a second type of hogshead, and that is the wine barrique hogshead. And those tend to be made in France or in Spain. Um, they will usually be used for wine maturation, uh, can be used for port or sherry maturation, although when they do that, that's more for the whiskey them supplying into the whiskey industry. And you can tell that they're different because they, they clearly have not been made from the American barrel because they're much higher, uh, much taller. So there's, there's two different types of hogsheads. They're not 250 liters as a simplification, depending on the supplier, it might be 10 liters more, 10, 10 liters less. Um, it, it just depends. Um, right, any other questions? Something has up with my mic. Uh -oh. Please tell me people can hear me and I've not just been talking silence for the last half hour. Uh, could somebody give me a hands up if they can hear me? Cool, right, maybe it just slipped. Uh, I'll keep going. Right, um, whiskey number two. I'm gonna use my overflow. Use glass. Whiskey number two is one of my favorite distilleries. It's not a Kalila, but it's up there and it is a Bladnock. Now, Bladnock used to be the most southern distillery in Scotland. It's in Dumfries and Galloway, uh, which is down in the southwest of Scotland. Uh, there's a new distillery or rebuilt distillery called Annandale, and that's stolen the title of the most southern distillery from Bladnock. Bladnock's had, like many distilleries in Scotland, it's had a very checkered past where um, it's been open, it's been shut, it's been closed, it's been mothballed. Um, it was owned by United Distillers in the early 90s. United Distillers would lead to become Diageo in 1997. And in the early 90s, they were really suffering. Um, there, was, there was an overproduction in whiskey and a decline in demand. And they'd already made some big culls in 1983 where they closed certain distilleries, um, things like Port Ellen, which today you, you'd think is unimaginable. Um, but then in, in the early 90s, they hit the same problem again, and they had to make decisions on closing certain sites. And in 1993, uh, they shut um, things like Rosebank Distillery. They decided to keep Glen Kinchy open because it's closer to Edinburgh. Um, but on top of that, they also shut Bladnock. Um, uh, so Bladnock uh, bit the dust for a good few years. 
Um, but then it was bought by, I think it was a Northern Irish guy. I forgot his name, sorry. Um, but yeah, it was bought by a Northern Irish guy um, in kind of the mid noughties and it's changed hand a couple of times since. And now it's developed into quite a, an interesting brand in its own right. It's got this cool kind of dumpy square bottles. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a lovely, interesting whiskey. It doesn't fall into the generalizations that people make about Lowlands. And I, I very firmly fall into the camp of not, I don't really believe in regionality in whiskey. That might be controversial, but we'll, we'll kind of talk through it over the next uh, hour, I guess. That's what we can do on this tasting. Um, Bladnox are two pots still. It's not triple distilled like a lot of people assume with all them whiskey. Um, and it actually creates quite a weighty, heavy spirit. If we just jump to the next slide, uh, you'll see that's, uh, that's a Bladnock. I think that's the wash still. I'm not sure. Um, but you'll see it's got the reflux bulb. That's going to help develop a nice light character. But really what's going on here is this line arm. That line arm is ascending down. So what that means is that all of the vapors, every single vapor that's going up the still, is going to go into the line arm. So that includes all the heavier, oilier vapors. If that line arm was angled up the way, some of those heavier vapors would condense back down to liquid before they get the chance to travel through. So the line angle really helps dictate spirit style and character. So Bladnock, although you've got, it's quite common in whiskey to have two kind of contradictory elements and it helps build complexity. So you've got these tall stills with lots of copper and the bulb to build light, delicate character, but then adversely you have this angle to create body. So there's kind of two contradictory things going on. And what that means with Bladnock is it's never thin. It's, it's never this kind of uh, light, crisp, Ockentoshan style of whiskey. It's, it's always got body and weight to it. And you can usually tell that from legs. Uh, so the longer the, the legs bead on the side of the glass, that's going to help dictate the mouthfeel and the body of the whiskey. And you can see on the diagram here, we're kind of a three out of five on body. So it's not up there with the big big bodies of things like Klein Leashes or Dal Ewans, but it, it, it's, it's still pretty weighty. Um, huge floral notes, always massive floral notes in Bladnock. Um, Bladnock to me, I quite commonly get lychee uh, fruit, exotic fruits. And I quite commonly get um, kind of honeysuckle characteristics as well. Um, but th there's something else that's a bit more unique with this whiskey. Um, and I'll just ask for a raise of hands to see if anybody knows this term. Has anybody heard of a rancio cask before? It's R-A-N-C-I-O, rancio casks. No hands? Great. I'm going to educate you. So... Uh, I'll just jump ahead quickly. There's three different ways of maturing whiskey. I'm going to go fast here. You've got Dunnage Warehousing, the kind of traditional old style that you see on your visitor center tours because it looks very, very beautiful. Um, those, those warehouses were built, you know, back when the distillery was built, more likely. Although you do get some craft distilleries like Brookladdy, like Kilhoman, who like to build their new distilleries with Dunnage. Uh, it's just a nice um, kind of... Uh, throwback to the old style of whiskey maturation. Your second type of maturation is what's called racked warehousing. That started around about the 60s and 70s. And what that means is you can get a rack of like 20 deep uh, on casks and then maybe 10 high. Uh, I used to do my work experience up at Glen Morangie and that was all racked warehousing. Um, and it was an absolute pain in the arse. Um, if, you, if you imagine you're 20 deep and you need to get cask number 17, You've got to take all the other 16 casks out to get to cask number 17, and it throws the whole thing out of sequence. So really, racked warehousing is designed for when you put entire parcels, so 20 of one type of cask into there, because you're going to take them all out at the exact same time and bound together for your single malt. Uh, so that, that's racked warehousing. But then the unsexiest, the uncoolest, but by far the most common that nobody really talks about, it's the ugly duckling, is the palletized warehousing. And this is the cold, hard reality of whiskey maturation. Whiskey is not matured in Dunnage warehousing. Maybe 5 10%, if you're lucky, of all Scotch whiskey is matured in Dunnage warehousing. If you want to see, Google the Black Range, Google Leven. You can go on Google Maps. You can see these warehouses from space. They're huge. Um, and this is where the majority of Scotch whiskey is matured. And 
you've got to be careful with what you're doing. You, you know, that, that whiskey is going away for a long time. And if you see the way that it's packed four barrels or four hogsheads per pallet or two butts per pallet, once those are on there and stacked, you cannot touch them. You cannot get into them. You cannot access them until you're removing that ready for bottling or selling it on. So what can happen in palletized warehousing is casks can get damaged. Casks can leak. Um, they can start giving off notes, but you're not going to know until you touch them. You can't go in there and, uh, sorry, you, you're not going to know until you unpack them, until you take them down. That could be 20 years later. It could be 30 years later. Um, so what happens sometimes is you get a cask that leaks. And as it leaks, you're decreasing liquid, obviously, but you're increasing oxygen into the cask. And what that oxygen, oxygen does is it, well, it starts to oxidize the, the whiskey. And that's what we call rancio. Rancio, uh, did I put a note of it here? Don't worry, I'm not going to, this looks like a scary slide. I'm, I'm not going to go into full science here. Basically, the, the best way to explain rancio is when you cut an apple and it turns brown. It oxidizes. Now, it doesn't just turn brown. The oxygen is having a reaction with uh, some of the molecules there, and it's kind of dulling them. It's making them nutty, making them kind of earthy. The exact same thing happens to whiskey. And what it actually does as well is it colors the whiskey. Uh, so some of these rancio casks are way darker than they should be. You know, they're in a four-fill spent barrel. They should be pale as anything. But you can see on that blood knock, okay, it's not the darkest, but it's got a nice, healthy kind of golden color to it. And that's developed from the rancio maturation. Now, I started to spot these casks like eight, nine years ago when I worked for a different company. And it was distilleries such as Kleinleach, Linkwood, Longmorn, and Bladnock, all United Distiller palletized warehouse casks. And it would be, you know, one in every 20 casks would be a rancio cask. The ABV's collapsed. It's dropped down to like 42, 43, 46 percent naturally, and it's really, really, you know, quite dark and odd. It shouldn't be this way. And you can see these um, these molecular diagrams on the left hand side. Don't worry, they're not too scary. But basically, what these are showing is they're showing some of the, the uh, aroma and flavor molecules that form when you start to oxidize and create rancio. So the little red dot that's your oxygen molecule, and everything else is carbon and hydrogen. And you start there with seven carbon, 14 hydrogen with one oxygen. And that is creating two hepatone, uh, hep hepatone I, can't, I can't pronounce it, which is the aroma of banana. And some people, you will detect banana in, in quite a few different whiskies. There's some other uh, esters and acetones that give you a banana characteristic as well. But then you can basically see as we go down this list to non unknown to undecagonone, I can't pronounce them, you can see that more carbons and hydrogens are building into this chain as the whiskey oxidizes. And that's where we go from something like banana, it's kind of light, to then cucumber, very unusual. You can sometimes get cucumber in bulmores. Certain bourbon cast bulmores have this really unusual kind of cucumbery. It sometimes smells a bit like green peppers, and that's this two uh, non unknown um, mo molecular build of, of oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon. You see, it's not, it's only, you know, a few more molecules added on, and then we've got this major flavor change. Uh, and when I'm saying it smells like cucumber, I'm not saying that I'm just picturing that. These exact same flavor molecules exist in cucumber. So it, when, when, when we get exploratory, we get a little bit over the top saying, oh, it's burst with orange. Orange is organic terpenes, citronelle, lemonol. They exist in barley. So when you ferment and distill, it exists in your whiskey, but it exists on the flesh of fruit. So we're, we're not just being imaginative here. We're actually talking about the organic chemistry, the building blocks of flavor. But I, I won't go into it too much, mainly because I don't actually know that much about it. I'm not a scientist. But uh, yeah, so you can see that some of these flavors are actually turning up in the blood knock. So the next chain uh, we've got here to undecanone, waxy, pineapple fruit, kind of overripe fruit notes, uh, creamy, fatty, uh, orris, orris root, kind of florals in there. And that's developing from this rancio maturation. And then the final one to try the canone, which I don't think this one has a lot of in, that's where you get to this really earthy, mushroomy, some people talk about like gaminess uh, or even truffles that they can smell in their whiskies. And Diageo use those casks quite a lot for their really premium Johnny Walkers. 
So maybe starting with the Johnny Walker Blue, but then going into the John Walkers for using these Rancio casks because it's just got this very unusual earthy, truffly uh, kind of note that you just can't recreate. They just they just appear from knackered old casks sometimes. So it's not even that, you know, quality cask is the best cask always. You just, you end up with these weird surprises. So I came across these kind of whiskies eight, nine years ago, and I, I just didn't know what to call them, what they were. I didn't find out. I just couldn't, I just kind of left it and, and forgot about it or enjoyed them when I came across them. But then Dave Broom, the whiskey writer, uh, did some presentations a couple of years ago in Edinburgh uh, we're a cocktail maker and it was actually a biochemist from Denmark. Uh, it was like a food chemist. Um, and they explained the rants your production. And if you drink cognac, they talk about this all the time. They're, 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 they're super aware of rants your casks. It's just a terminology and an expertise that didn't exist in Scotland uh, with whiskey. But we're now really starting to understand it a lot more. Um, and this blood knock, as well as having the florals and the body from the production, this is definitely a rants your cask. And that's where you get all those lovely overripe, that kind of overripe pineapple note. And then there's almost like this kind of dunnagey, earthy characteristic going on with it as well. I love Blad Knox. Um, I've not had a lot of the newer production stuff, but these kind of 90, 1990, 91, you might find some 1992s, but then I think production stopped. They're really worth seeking out. They're the beautiful, beautiful whiskies, and they don't just fall into this oversimplification of light, delicate, lowland whiskey. There's a, there's a lot more going on. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's the, the Bladnock distillery there. Uh, I'm just going to check. I heard some noises. Have we got any questions? Not so important, but is there any story about how or why you, Weems, went to react, relax, soft label style? Ooh, hive peat chimney catch the eye and would stand out on, on a shelf. The rest I would probably quickly take my eyes away from. Uh, this is quite a long question. Uh, <laughs> what we're looking for are written in another way. Seems you decided to go less eye-catching way in the branding and is that the best way to go in general? It's a little bit too wordy a question. I'm not really sure. Uh, I mean, a, a branding, I suppose the thing about branding is we're, we're not pretending to be 200 years old. We're, we're not a 200-year-old company. We've been around since 2005. So we lean more into the little bit more kind of crisp, clean, contemporary style. You'll see that with the, the, the metallic uh, cartons behind me. Then with the single cask, you know, there's a lot of information to portray on there. So there's a lot of different fonts to kind of uh, show the differentiation of that information. And then the colors, uh, the colors are going by region. So the color signif signifies uh, a different region. So green is lowland. Uh, sorry, green is uh, Speyside, orange is lowland, blue is Isla, pink is Highland. Uh, there's a lighter orange, which is uh, the lowland. Campbelltown's a kind of terracotta. And then we've got a biscuit color for green. Uh, so it's just the branding that we've got. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it at that just now. Uh, we'll see if you want to expand on that question later on. Uh, one quick thing I wanted to show you as well, because this is another misconception with whiskey maturation. Uh, where was it? So this is when I did my brewing and distilling course last year. Now, how many people, we'll get a, we'll get a show of hands, how many people have heard a, a person in whiskey, whether it's a tour guide or somebody doing a tasting or maybe a shop assistant, talk about how the spirit sits in the cask as it goes through the seasons expands and contracts and it seeps right into the oak and then you can see here you can see how deep that that spirit's penetrating into the cask how many people have come across that before or heard somebody say that yeah it's pretty common it's not true what you're seeing there is you're seeing several butts uh, sorry several staves oak staves put together they're not glued they're not nailed they're just tight to tight what you're seeing is the liquid seep in between the two staves because on the second picture here, we've done a cross section. We've cut right through the stave. There's no liquid stain. The liquid doesn't penetrate a centimeter into the cask. It penetrates a centimeter into the cask there. It would leak out the side of the cask at the seams. You know, oak, oak is porous, but it's not that porous. We've kind of, somebody's over-exaggerated this a little bit. Um, it, it's not about that deep wood penetration that's, that's creating those character and flavors. The first thing is the, the toasting or the char. Now, this, I think, is a red wine barrique. 
that's been toasted and not charred. So, but the toasting, you're still uh, using, it's the Maillard process and pyrolyzation. You're, you're still caramelizing some of the sugars in the cask. And once you take, especially once you get to carbon kind of char from a bourbon cask, if you took a centimeter uh, squared of that carbon and flattened it out, it would be the size of a football pitch. Just the, there's a huge amount of surface area in that um, toasted or charred cask. And surface area, like with any scientific reaction, the more surface area, the greater the efficiency. Um, so it, it, it's, it's the char, it's the toasting that's really helping there. And then also it's the solvency of the spirit that's in the cask. So sherry casks, you're not getting huge amounts of sherry because there's 10 liters of sherry absorbed into the cask. You're getting the tannins. And what it is, is the sherry that was in the cask before is what, 18, 19%. So it's what's called a low solvency alcohol. It's lowly solvent. It's not taking out, it's not stripping, sucking out all of the tannins and lingons and sugars in the cask. If I chuck in a 70% new make spirit from America, that's a high solvency spirit and that's stripping everything out so that's the difference that's why a european oak sherry cask and american oak have such a difference in color and tannin there's other things going on yes you've got the oloroso sherry in there you've maybe got the species of the oak between american oak and european oak but it's to do with the solvency of the virgin spirit so whether it's sherry whether it's port whether it was bourbon that's what's making such a huge difference in the cast maturation anyway it's just a quick uh it's just a quick little thing that i like to point out because it's, it's such a i hear it so many times and it's it just doesn't exist it's, it's not real and i mean get you probably have some of you who are collectors or work in whiskey shops probably have a stave at home just do that look at it you'll see if you actually cut the stave or have, have that bottom half of the stave you can see the liquid's not penetrating into it anyway and that, that's an older one. That's not, uh, that's not a sherry, but that, I think that looks like an old American oak cask. You can see multiple uses and the, the, the multiple stainage, but just the same American oak cut through it, and there's not that heavy penetration of, uh, of liquid. Anyway. Um, right. If you were able to delete one whiskey memory, what would it be? Uh, has anyone heard of Fireball? <laughs> Fireball is a Canadian uh, whiskey liqueur made by Seagreens, and I was in America last year. And uh, it's quite cool. They serve it on a, on, a, on a ski. So you'll get four of them on one ski, and the idea is you lift, lift up the ski and four of you drink it all at once. Um, it's a cinnamon-sugared uh, whiskey liqueur, and it's, it's pretty rough stuff. Um, and it can lead to interesting nights. So, I mean, part of that memory has been deleted by the alcohol, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I would, I would delete the rest of that night uh, and never drink Fireball again. Anyway. <laughs> uh, right, whiskey number three. So, blue label. This is a Isla. Let's switch to a different glass. But you can see on the flavor wheel, we're not dealing with very smoky whiskey. It wouldn't be the smartest thing to put very smoky whiskey as dram number three on the tasting because um, you could really overwhelm your palate. So what we've actually done here is we've kept this distillery a secret. We've not named it. It's very uncommon for us to do that. We did that a little bit back in the beginning, um, but we pretty much decided that we were always going to name all of the whiskeys that we put into our single casks. It limits the availability of what you can buy um because you know sometimes there's really really beautiful whiskies out there but if you name them uh if you name the distillery you're not allowed to buy that cask so sometimes you kind of paint it into a corner do you bottle this amazing whiskey and not name it uh or do you not buy it sometimes it's not even our decision sometimes it's a customer's decision so this bottling we didn't decide not to name it uh there was a particular customer that wanted a decent amount of this cask but they were not allowed to have the name in their shop, so we kept it a secret, and we're going to keep, keep we're going to keep it a secret. We're not we're not going to tell you what it is. Um, but I thought it would be interesting to um, get your thoughts on any guesses as to what it would be. Um, so I'll talk about it briefly, give you some clues, and uh, I want to see if anyone's got any thoughts. So just to kind of quickly recap, um, there are currently nine active distilleries uh, on Isla. 
you've what's called the, got called the Kildalton Trio down in the south. Uh, that is Ardberg, Lagerbullen, and Lefroig. They were kind of known as the heaviest style, um, always up at kind of 50 ppm, barley in, very, very smoky style. Ardberg's maybe a little bit sweeter and smokier, but you've got those three. You've got Beaumont Distillery, which is the oldest distillery on the island. So the town was actually built around the distillery. It's got a little bit more of a softer smoke element, uh, maybe a little bit more floral element to it sometimes as well. Um, then away into the east, we have three distilleries. We've got Kalila and Bunnahabhain. Kalila tends to be more smoky, but it's not as pungent as, say, the southern islands of Lagavulin. uses the exact same barley as Lagavulin, the exact same raw ingredient, but it's production process, larger stills. Um, the cut point of the spirit safe uh, means that it creates a slightly different uh, whiskey. It's actually, uh, it's a little bit of a dirty secret on Isla that most of the distilleries use exactly the same barley, the exact same peating level. So Lagavulin, Ardbeg, um, Kalila, Kilhoman, even though they're independent for the bulk of their production, they're using the exact same 50 ppm barley. Brookladdy, when they make Port Charlotte, that's 50 ppm. It's all the exact same barley. It comes from Port Ellen Maltings. It's just their production, their maturation that is creating the variation in the style. But there are distilleries that malt their own barley and, and sauce from other places as well. So, um, yeah, you've got your Kalila, uh, you've got your Bonnehaben. doesn't tend to be as smoky, although they do a little bit of peated production. They actually tend to be unpeated, quite malty, quite creamy. Uh, and then we've got Ardnahol, which is the new distillery on Isla. It's the only distillery on Isla that uses a worm tub to condense its spirit. So we're expecting that to be quite an oily, heavy-bodied Isla, as well as being smoky. Uh, then if we go over to the west, uh, we've got Brookladdy Distillery that produces three different styles. Well, technically four. You've got the unpeated Brookladdy uh, that's light, malty, some people even say a little bit cheesy. Uh, you've got Port Charlotte, which is that medium peated that uses the Port Ellen maltings. You've got Lockendal, which you barely see any of, that's slightly more peated. And then you've got Octomore, which is the most peated whiskey in the world, and they do that in a, a whole range of specification. And then you've got Kilhoman, uh, which is one of the newer styles on the island as well, small farm distillery. So you've got nine working distilleries. Uh, there's another four, uh, three really, that are planned. Uh, you've got Gartbreck, uh, which is down by Bormore. Um, You've got Sakinda Singh from the Whiskey Exchange is planning a new distillery down in the south. And then Port Charlotte's kind of still on the books is being built, but I don't think Brookladdy, I never hear that they're actually going to do it because they've got the brands, but theoretically on, on the maps, there, there is this other planned distillery. And you can see there actually used to be tons of other distilleries on Isla, up to 15. Um, some on the same site, smaller stills, some on completely isolated sites. Um, we were actually going to go over to the Feshiel this year in May, but it was sadly cancelled. And we were going to do some tastings in abandoned um, distilling sites, one of which was a cave with a waterfall. And we we're going to do the tasting in the cave, but uh, maybe 2021 we'll get to do that. Um, so yeah, I've detailed all nine of the working distilleries. So let's maybe get people, just, just chuck in, chuck in, in in the chat any guesses as to what you think this whiskey might be. Um, it's not particularly heavily smoked. It's got nice kind of vanilla cereal notes coming through, quite floral. I'm going to taste this one at full strength as well. Yeah, I remember why I put this as whiskey number three on the tasting. It, it's it's just really really soft. It's soft. It's buttery. It's malty. The only inkling, you know, if you're tasting this blind, the only inkling that this is a, there's an Isla is it's a slight maritime. I, I don't like to say salty because there isn't actually any salt in whiskey. So anytime somebody says they're tasting salt, you're not. It's not physically possible to taste salt in whiskey. Um, it's more likely it's complex kind of sulfur compounds. Uh, that have this meaty, savoury edge. And especially if you've got some marketing with fishing boats and, and an island or sea waves on a, on a bottle, that's going to kind of plant the seed in your head that you're, you're tasting a salty whiskey. But it's not possible for salt to be in whiskey. If, if, you, if you have a pot still with salt water and you distill it, you're going to be left with the salt and you're going to have the H2O vaporised on the other side or condensed on the other side. Salt can't travel up the, the, the still arm. It, it's... Yeah, just not possible. Um, yeah, so let's see. Have we got anybody chucking in an answer? 
No, not yet. Um, well, do some people maybe want to guess, chuck in any thoughts as to which of the distilleries they think it might be? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, well, I'll leave it just now. And if anybody's got any guesses, uh, they can just chuck it into the, uh, the chat. And uh, I'll, I'll, I won't give you the answer, but I'll see, see how close people are getting uh, with it. But yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic whiskey. It's just, it's just so mellow and soft and nuanced, and it's got a nice body to it as well. You could, you could spend a lot of time with this whiskey. I kind of, I must don't want to chuck this one away. I'm gonna, oh, I've got blood knock in my other glass as well. Damn it, this is getting difficult. Drink a little bit of that. Right. So let's carry on going. So whiskey number four, we're kind of picking up the pace now a little bit. Hopefully you're not just shotting these, keep them in a separate glass or come back to them later on in the uh, day or week. So this whiskey here, uh, whiskey number four, we named it Summer Fruit Salads. Um, it's one of those where at the time we probably all, it really, it, it depends on when, you know, what time of day you're tasting it and who you've got in your tasting panel. Um, your palate kind of changes as the day goes by. 11 o'clock is kind of the best time in the morning, I think, to try whiskies. And at that time, we, we made a lot of notes about kind of floral and fruity uh, elements, which are, which are definitely there in this whiskey. Um, but there's, there's buckets of vanilla that we kind of translated into this kind of ice cream sundae kind of vibe because you've got the banana, the red berry fruits, and you've got this vanilla element. So we're, we're almost kind of picturing this uh, vanilla sundae. Um, but when I went back to this last week, you kind of forget, you know, it, it is a Klein leash and a Klein leash usually has one very prominent thing. And this is when I talk again about Diageo and their flavor profiles, we talked about Linkwood. Linkwood is what they call grassy and they have quite a few distilleries that fall into that grassy profile. The next profile they have is nutty. Uh, so that would be something like Blair Raffle that runs a, a cloudy warp when they uh, ferment. Uh, sorry, when they mash. Um, so they've got grassy, nutty, uh, oily, then waxy, and peppery. That's the, that's the, the six flavor profiles that they used to uh, adhere to. Of the waxy, there's only one. There's only one distillery that they class as waxy because it, it's very, very hard to replicate. It was actually done by accident, um, and that's Kleinleash. Kleinleash is the waxy distillery. Um, it, it, it's quite an unusual one. I mean, it's... If we jump to the next slide, again, it's not the prettiest of distilleries. You'll see that car showroom vibe that I was talking about before with Linkwoods. That's that kind of 60s, 70s United Distillers era. Uh, so they, they, uh, they had another distillery on site, Brora or Kleinleash A, I think it's called. Um, so there's was, there was two different distilleries running at the same time, but now Kleinleash uh, is referred to as this modern build distillery. And I think they're actually looking at rebuilding Brora and launching that again. Uh, this kind of cult closed distillery from the 80s. Um, but we're, we're talking about standard Klein Leash here that isn't peated. Uh, it's, it's usually a low phenol 1 2 ppm. So you wouldn't detect any heavy smoke from it. Um, what's really special or unusual with Klein Leash is um, they're, just, they're just mucky buggers. They just don't clean it. <laughs> um, so when you're distilling, um, you know, the, the liquid has to go somewhere. It goes into what's called a receiver. That's a fancy word for a tank. Um, and you could have the whole content go into the tank. Or maybe you split it up. So the four shots, the faints go into one tank, the, the cup go into the other tank. And then you do the same with the spirit stills as well. So you could actually have multiple. You could have theoretically six different tanks. Um, their low wines receiver tank, um, you know, that's, that's the first thing that runs off the still so it could still have some of like the barley biomass from the mash in it it's low abv um it's got all sorts of oils and fatty acids and junk you know it's it's not drinkable um it's it's just yeah um it, it's kind of byproduct that you read still um you're supposed to clean out that receiver most distilleries will clean it out a couple of weeks or a, a month climbing stone they, they, they just didn't clean it for years. Uh, and what happened is, is this kind of residual 
scum together. Um, it's best name, uh, this kind of oily, waxy compounds just built up in the receiver. And then we're emptying that into the still and redistilling it. So that's what built this waxy body into Klein Leash. It's got nothing to do with line on angle, well, some of the other flavors, but it's not worm tub condensed to create heavy body. It's because these spirit receivers, they just didn't clean them. Um, and even now they do clean them. But what they do is they, they take the dirty content out, clean it, and then put the dirty content back in. It's kind of like cleaning your toilet and then going for number two right away. Um, it's, it's a bit of a strange one. But that, that's how they end up with this really, really unusual spirit style. And Diageo have even been trying to replicate this because Klein Leash is in growing demand. And it's not a small distillery, but blenders really, really love it because it's a great way of getting body into your blend. But then with single casks, it's, it's kind of taken off. Although it's, it's an ugly kind of industrial looking distillery, it has got a bit of a cult uh, following behind it. Uh, part of that's to do with a French whiskey writer called Serge Valentin. He started assigning grand crew statuses to all of uh, the, the whiskies uh, like you would with, with wine regions, it's French. Um, and the, the kind of number one grand crew status, uh, he's only ever given that to Klein Leash. Uh, he, he obviously loves it. And there's just this kind of, elusive scented candle waxiness uh i sometimes get kind of like bread dough as well like kind of pretzel dough or something like that coming through but then there's all the fruity notes and the vanilla and the banana that's coming from from cask and coming from the ester development and the whiskey as well i love klein leash klein leash is up there in my top 10 of scotch distilleries um we've actually just released um as our fourth cast club, we, we have a, a cast club membership. Um, we do one bottling every couple of months of what we deem to be a, a very, very excellent cask. Um, and our, our latest release is called uh, Tropical Scented Candle. We literally just released that this week. Um, it's not a sister cask. I think it's a couple of years older than this one. Um, this one's 1995. It almost doesn't matter with, with Klein Leash. A Klein Leash could be young. A Klein Leash could be old. The consistency is always there. It's always excellent i've never had it's like kalila never had a bad one you know it's not you know bun harbin distillery they've got heavily peated unpeated mild cast maturation heavy cast maturation you know it's kind of all over the shop but klein leash in terms of its quality and consistency is just a straight line it's, it's always excellent um so i i really really enjoy klein leash whiskies even though it's not the uh the coolest looking of distilleries and uh, i kind of hope people really really enjoy this I mean, those kind of esters, those fruit character that you're getting, again, it's, it's a slightly unusual build of a distillery. Uh, we were talking about those rule of thirds earlier on. This is another distillery where, if you see down here, the wash still, 25,000 litres content, big still, charged with 17,000 litres. And then for some reason, again, it's one of these weird distilleries, there's not many of them, where the spirit still is larger than the wash still. So even though, you know, there's, there's not a lot, much more liquid going in it just means that there's much more space uh, for vapor development and uh, for copper contact and that's always going to help build those really lovely kind of fruity characteristics and strip away any uh, negative flavors so that could be uh, heavy kind of sulfur compounds or really kind of acrid fusel oils that kind of stuff the copper helps take all that out um, so yeah we just end up with a, a lovely delightful new make character and I've, I've been lucky enough to to try Klein Leash new make and it, it is bizarre it's it's kind of almost it, it smells a bit like clay kind of like a clay pit or something like that it's, it's really really unusual um but all those fruit character is, is still there as well so yeah Klein Leash is right up there in terms of uh the, the best distilleries in Scotland in my opinion so it's excellent excellent stuff and I've completely contradicted myself I'm not diluting them. I'm not nosing them. I am actually drinking them now, but it's Friday, so what? <laughs> right. Um, I'll just quickly, because um, people might have questions and they might forget them um, by the time we get to the end. Um, if anybody's got any quick questions um, about what we've been talking about. Um, oh, I've just noticed there's a chat. Ah, here it is. Here's everyone's guesses. Sorry, I, I didn't see this. Right, we'll go back to the secret isla. Uh, so I've got a few different guesses here. Brookladdy, uh, another one Brookladdy, Bunna, Bunna, Unpeated Kalila. 
Uh, good guesses. Uh, nobody there has picked a peated distillery, so that's good. Nobody has picked a distillery that um, is closed or in production but not old enough, so that's good. One person has asked unpeated Kalila. That's a good guess, um, except I don't think Kalila started doing unpeated releases in any kind of unpeated distillates until into the late 90s. Could be wrong there, but uh, they were pretty much running peated spirit the whole time and then started experimenting with unpeated uh, liquids. Um, again, it was never for single malt. It was to help with blending. Khalil is a giant distillery, so they, they had the capacity to do that. Um, but uh, no, this one isn't Kalila. Uh, which leaves it to Bukladi and Bunahaban, uh, which I kind of expected people would guess between. Um, and I'm not going to tell you the answer, but what I'm going to point out here is what's great about those two distilleries is one is very purposely trying to be innovative, different, a lot of variety. You know, Bukladi, we're talking about obviously uh, when it was kind of reestablished in 2001, very experimental one distillery producing four different spirit styles of different peating levels, different cut points, all sorts of unusual cast maturations. It means that Brooklady just has this huge plethora. I don't know if anyone went to the distillery before it was bought over a couple of years back. You go into the visitor center shop, it was like 400 different bottles. They had like the bins up at the top, they just had bottles just kind of jam packed in there. They had so many different, uh, so, so much variety out there. Bonner Harbin did that by accident. Um, it did that from multiple ownerships, uh, Highland Distillers, Edrington, it's now Burns Stewart, um, really varied cask management, um, kind of crappy old refill casks. But like I said earlier with Rancio, that doesn't necessarily mean you get a bad product at the end. Uh, sherry butts, American oak, European oak. And they actually, um, they would take in uh, orders of peated barley and just distill it. So even though they had this, aim of being the kind of gentle giant uh, of the Isla, you can find back as early as 91, 92, peated Bonaharbans, which were, must have been an experiment or just a wrong order of barley. Then what happened is um, Black Bottle, the blend, um, that started to need to rely on Bonaharban to make its peated whiskey. Traditionally, it used to get peated whiskey from a lot of East Coast distilleries, um, which are now closed. They, they were lost in 83 and 93 as well. So it, it needed a distillery to produce peated whiskey for it. So Bonaharban started producing peated whiskey as well, um, mainly to supply Black Bottle. And that's what you see now uh, with some of their single malt releases, that they're actually doing unpeated. So the 12, the 15, the 18, uh, they're unpeated, but then they call them Siobhanics, um, God, I can't remember, Moina, there's, there's tons of different names for the peated Bonaharban. And I asked a blender at, at, at Burn Stewart, as, uh, Olivier is called, Olivier Fagan, and I asked him, what's the difference between a Bonaharban peated Siobhanic, a Bonaharban peated Moina, a Bonaharban peated Strona, or whatever it's called? And they're like, they're all the same, just depends on what customer. We just name them different names when we sell them to a different customer. It's all the exact same whiskey, but just different name. So yeah. End of the rant there is basically one is purposely experimental and varied. The one, the other one is accidentally um, varied. Um, and I, I won't give it away. I think it's, it's too close to call. Maybe if you're a really deep Brooklady or Bonner Harbin aficionado, you might be able to tell. But we're, we're going to keep it a secret uh, because that's what the customer wanted. Uh, but it doesn't stop it being a really nice, really interesting, mellow whiskey. Right. Uh, yeah, so some good guesses there, but and some of you got it right, but who knows which. Right, uh, no other questions just now, so I'll keep going. And whiskey number five is called My Lovely Valentine. A uh, little bit of play on words of My Bloody Valentine. I also sometimes slip hip hop lyrics into some of the names as well. So uh, you, can, you can, might be able to guess those sometimes. Um, but yeah, this is, um, this is a great space side distillery. This is a Glen Rothis. Um, it's a bit of a workhorse distillery. It's very, very large. I think it's kind of six, seven million liter production. Um, 
it was owned by Berry Brothers and they were, they were doing independent bottlings. It just sold and traded a huge amount as blending stock. And over the last couple of years, there's been a bit of a tug of war between Berry Brothers and Edrington, uh, the owners of McAllen and Highland Park. They were distributing uh, bottling Glen Rothes, but it wasn't actually owned by them. Um, but now Edrington, because they've got all that McAllen money, uh, they, they, they bought, uh, they bought uh, Berry Brothers uh, out and they fully own um, Glen Rothes now. Um, Glen Rothes, again, it's another one of these kind of contradictory distilleries. Um, if you jump to the next slide, uh, you see that's the a very beautiful for, for a large distillery. It's, it's a very, very beautiful distillery. And then you can see uh, the still house here. It's just massive. Like the stills are huge. Uh, they're tall. They're not Glen Morangy tall. Glen Morangy has the tallest stills in Scotland, 7.2 meters or something. It's height of a draft neck is the marketeer's term. These aren't as tall as that. I think they're up at about six meters, but they're big, they're fat, they're wide, they've got reflux bulbs. And then you can see the condensers, the shell and tube condensers, they're massive. They're almost as big as the, uh, the stills themselves. Um, so you're getting a huge amount of copper contact. So you should really expect this to be as floral and delicate and fragrant and light as Glenmorangie. But it's not, it's, it's heavier, it's got deeper sweetness to it. So the two things you've got kind of working against each other in my production notes here is fermentation time is very short. It's only fermented for 55 to 65 hours. Um, you, you could push it early. You could go to 48 hours if you want. That's really cutting it fine. So, you know, that fermentation time is, is very, very short. You're not going to get a lot of like kind of complex over ester development, the, you know, development of aldehydes as well, which are the floral notes. That all comes much later after the lag stage of fermentation. So, you know, the yeast ferments the, the, the carbohydrate, the starch, the sugars from the wort in the first 48 hours. Then everything else is flavor development. It's these kind of combinations of, of esters and aldehydes. This, this distillery doesn't give the chance for that. Um, if you were to put that through like kind of normal size stills, you'd probably get something quite like earthy and dry coming out of it. But my kind of hazard of guess is because of that, those giant stills, you're just getting a huge amount of copper contact. Then also it comes down to the spirit safe and the cut. You know, you don't take 100% of the distillate. You might only take 15, 20% of that final spirit distillate. The earlier you cut, the lighter, the sweeter, the fruitier the spirit. If you cut later, it's going to be less fruity and more kind of earthy and dry and nutty. And you can tell that they've cut early because of the ABV. The ABV of the Numic is 70%, which is quite high. It's not as the highest, uh, the highest in Scotland's Ockentoshan, which is 78. They achieve that from having triple distillation. This is still quite high, though. You know, it, it, it could be 67, it could be 66, 68 maybe. Um, but this shows that they've cut very, very early. It's a clue in the production. They've cut, cut early in the distillation, so that's how they're achieving some really lovely uh, fruity notes, even though it's not there in the fermentation. Or they've managed to concentrate it more by, by cutting uh, that little bit uh, early and capturing the higher alcohols and, and, and the, the brighter esters. So, I mean, I've not even tasted this yet. Uh, I did back in the day, but I kind of already know what to expect. For me, Glen Rothes is all about red berries. It's not there in the new mic, but once you mature, the bulk of Glen Rothes is uh, matured in sherry casks. Um, so it could be a sherry butt or a sherry hogshead. This is a hogshead, and given its paleness, again, we're, we're talking about refill. So this is likely a third fill, uh, sherry hogshead. Doubt it's a second. It's, it's certainly not a first fill. First fill, we would maybe start to lose, especially at that age, we'd lose spirit character. It'd just become overwhelmed. But again, because this is a refill, we still get to understand the, the beauty of, of the, the craft that's gone into that spirit while also seeing the wood influence come in. So yeah, red berry, strawberry, and then I get uh, geranol. Geranol um, is a terpene that is associated with flowers, uh, specifically rose. So, you know, you, you can actually concentrate that and make uh, like rose water flavoring for Turkish delight, um, but it's naturally occurring in whiskey, uh, in certain whiskies. And you can really pick it up on there. It's this lovely kind of floral, red berry, rose kind of uh, aroma. 
and then we get some lovely tannin interaction here so we're getting kind of vanilla and chocolate coming in uh, so i remember when we did the tasting panel for this we're like roses chocolate strawberries so it's a valentine's whiskey so that, that's how it ended up uh with the uh, the my lovely valentine uh name uh for it but uh yeah glen Rothis is uh it's a space island steroids it's, it's red berry just so so intense it's absolutely lovely stuff um they've gone through a little bit of a rebranding on their commercial releases and i've not had a chance to to try many of them yet they used to be a proponent of vintages no age statements just vintages but they've, they've given up on that and, and gone for, for the bit uh, for the uh, the age statements so I'll, I'll definitely have to try those uh, when when the world <laughs> opens back up again i'll just mail order them maybe uh, but yeah beautiful stuff uh, anything else to quickly talk about there on Glen Rothis? Uh, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you um, the etymologies of the whiskies. There's so much to talk about, but not enough time. Um, but yeah, you, you can see there that um, Glen Rothis, uh, basically it means ring fort. Um, so it's the great, the good fort. So at some point up there, there was some kind of fortification um, and the name kind of evolved from that. Um, so yeah, that, that's Glen Rothis. Klein Leash um, means the sloped garden in, uh, in Old Gaelic. Uh, Secret Island Distillery just means Secret Island Distillery. Um, the Bladnock, uh, that was the name of a local river, Bladnock River. Uh, Linkwood, again, is, is named after the, the, the Linkwood estate, the house uh, that's on the same site. Um, and I'll, I'll make sure I name the etymologies of the other whiskies uh, as we go on. Uh, so my lovely Valentine, I'll just check the, the chat. Uh, Mads Nielsen, you talked about 70% is an early cut. What would the ABV be in a late cut? Um, you would drop down to potentially 63 or 64. What that cut is, is it's, it's an, uh, that final ABV, it's an average of the strength over time. So the first, as soon as you switch that spirit safe, you're going to have your highest point of alcohol, so say it's 78%. But then as an hour, half an hour goes by, the ABV stops to drop, starts to drop. So you start with 78, then you maybe finish with 63. So you take once that's all mixed together, the average strength is maybe going to be 70. Um, the highest that I know of is Ockentoshan. And because Ockentoshan does triple distillation, um, they're able to achieve a much higher strength from pot, copper pot distillation. And that's, that's what single malt is. You can go higher, um, but you can't do it with copper pot stills. You need to do it with continuous stills. And that's what grain whiskey is or neutral grain spirit. So uh, I think grain whiskey spirit is 94.5% in alcohol. And then the difference between what ends up making Johnny Walker or Bell's as grain whiskey and then the difference to neutral grain spirit that's vodka is one percent abv so neutral grain spirit is 95.5 um it's only one abv in difference but in that one abv difference it's where a huge amount of the congeners the flavors are and that's stripped away when you do continuous distillation and really 96 is as high as you can get um i think there's there's other ways of doing it but through actual physical distillation you, you, you theoretically can't get any higher than kind of 96% ABV. You've got to do all sorts of other complicated things like a uh, hydro selective analyzation that strips out the fusel oils and, and all sorts of stuff. Um, but that's, that's the difference between grain distillate, continuous stills and copper pot. Copper pot, 78 is the highest you can get. So hopefully that answers that question. Uh, anything else in that chat? I can't even find it now. I'll, I'll come back to it. Uh, that was Glenn Rothis. Um, we've talked a little bit about stills, so I just wanted to quickly show you this. You know, this is this is uh, some of the nuts and bolts that really go into um, helping create flavour in whiskey, and it just shows the diversity that's out there with whiskey stills. Um, you can see you've got a kind of normal neck still up here, um, but then what was quite common in the kind of mid 19th century, once you started to learn a little bit more was to start adding bulbs, uh, some call it an onion bulb, some call it a reflux bulb, um, into the stills. And what they're basically doing is it's creating reflux. Reflux means when uh, alcohol vapor condenses back down to liquid. So and that means it's got to evaporate again, it gets more copper contact again, so we get lighter, delicate, 
Christmas spirit. So that's what those reflux bulbs are for. And you can see them in all sorts of weird, wacky iterations. Uh, the Glen Grant one has this kind of weirder, square um, bulb. Glen Morangy has a tiny one because it's got really tall stills. Uh, so it's still got a little bit there. Glen Grant has this kind of angular shaped one. And then Pulteney's just utterly bizarre. It doesn't even have a neck. The whole film thing is just a bulb. So you're getting a huge amount of reflux but then it's a flat top. So again, it's it, the, the spirit can't go anywhere but the neck. So even though you're getting light reflux, it's taking everything. So that's where you end up in Pulteney with this odd juxtaposition of sweet like delicate and oily because of those spirit shapes. Uh, Bunnerhaben, which we'll have later on, you see it's got that really big fat still um, where there's almost no reflux going on. Uh, so you're going to get these kind of oily, sulfury uh, elements to it. Um, so yes, still shape is so, so important in, in creating these characters and flavor. And then that's not even getting into how the spirit's condensed, shell and tube condenser, worm tub, all the cut points in the spirit safe. This is where a huge amount of uh, the development of the flavor and style comes from, is the distillation. Uh, oh yeah, and that, that's a, a quick thing I wanted to show you. Um, so there's actually 10 different things that influence um, the, the flavor of a spirit style based off of the uh, still. So first is obviously the shape, which we just talked about. Second is the height. So you can have really short, dumpy stills like Bunna Harbin or um, God, I suppose Edra Dower being a small still. Uh, that, 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 that's quite a good example. Or you can have big, tall stills like Glen Morangy. And it's not just about the reflux. It's, it's just got a longer time for the vapor to rise. Um, so there's more chance of it cooling and condensing back down. And then you get that extra reflux. Line arm angle, we've talked a little bit about, and I'll mention it in some of the other distilleries. So the line arm is angled up. Those vapors have to uh, fight, uh, and they might recondense before they reach the end. So you get that reflux. More common is the straight line arm, or then you can have the fuller line arm, which was like blood knock, and that's just going to capture everything. It doesn't matter, you know, if, if the vapor condenses here, it's still going to fall into the condenser, whereas on the, the still with the line arm angled up, if it, if, it, if, it, if it condenses there, it's going to fall back down into the still. So that angle is, is very, very important. Rate of distillation, uh, that's down to two things, temperature and speed. Things like, uh, you know, some distilleries that are maybe under a lot of pressure, they would, they would um, have the coils in the still already heated, and then they would add the, the wash or the, uh, into the stills and get this immediate uh, vaporization. Some theorize that some of the bull mods from the 80s that are referred to uh, as having a very strong lavender flavor. Uh, some unruly people call it a French horse perfume. Um, some people theorize that they were speeding up the stills, and that was one of the reasons why they got that really kind of intense floral, soapy note. Um, but I've never had a confirmation uh, from Jim, uh, Jim McEwen on that. Uh, yeah, so that's a uh, rate of speed uh, and temperature. Polish, which is quite unusual. Uh, one of the mentions we get, uh, hopefully people know, Weems Maltz is the owner of King's Barnes Distillery. That's a King's Barnes single cask there. You know, that distillery has only been around since 2014, so they're expecting beautiful, shiny, lacquered stills. But when you go in, the stills are dull, they're stained, they've got handprints. You know, they're, they're kind of like the picture down, they're not as bad as that. But they're not this clean shininess. Uh, you only achieve that by lacquering the stills. It's not just polishing them, it's actually applying a lacquer. And what the lacquer does is it retains heat. And if you're retaining heat, then there's less chance of condensing the vapor. There's less chance of reflux. So actually, the more efficient stills, if you had the same still, same, same shape, size, same cut points, if one was lacquered and one was unlacquered, unlacquered would have more reflux and would give you a lighter spirit. So the decision was made at King's Barnes not to lacquer the still. So it's, it's ugly, but efficient. That's, that's the difference. Uh, it's not always about looks. Then um, what else do we have here? Purifier in the line arm. It's not common. Uh, distilleries like Ardbeg uh, have a purifier. Uh, and what you see is this extra pipe. And basically what that's doing is if there's any... Uh, vapors that condense in the line arm, they fall back down this, uh, this extra purifier and go back into the pot. So you almost, it, it's not, some people might call it a double distillation or a triple distillation, um, but because it's all happening in the same still, it's technically not a new distillation. It's, it counts as reflux. 
Ardbeg has that, and that's one of the reasons I think Ardbeg is one of the few smoky whiskies where the new make is sweet. Uh, mainly very smoky whiskies. If you taste their new make, it's very dry. You know, Lagerbill and new make is incredibly dry. Uh, so is Lafroy new make. Um, but Ardbeg isn't, and I, I think a little bit of that's to do with the Purifier Lama line arm. If you're using a Lohman still, which we're going to talk about later on with the last whiskey, you can actually have copper plates inside the still, and that's going to increase uh, uh, copper contact and create something called equilibrium in the still uh, that basically means that you've got condensation and vaporization happening at the same time uh, in those plates, and that ends up with uh, getting a very, very light style of spirit. Uh, water cooling on the still head, very uncommon. Uh, Feta can have that. I think Dalmore has it on one of the stills. And it takes form in many different ways. Some is kind of like a jacket. Others is like a kind of flat head where the water pools on top. And you're basically just adding an extra coolant onto the, uh, onto the still. Charge volume, we talked about a little bit earlier. So that's when you've got a big still, but not much liquid in it. Uh, so Linkwood, we talked about that had that larger still, but with not much content. And actually, I think the best example I talk about quite often is Lagavulin and Kalila. As I already said earlier, uses the exact same barley from Port Ellen, 50 ppm uh, barley in. Um, but Kalila uh, has bigger stills and they're not filled. They're not char- You've got to charge. They're, they're not charged as much. So you get much more uh, space for vaporization and much more copper contact. And that's how Kalila, in my opinion, ends up coming out a lot more kind of delicate, where Lagavulin's a little bit more dry and gutsy. Your cut points have stuff to do with that as well. And then still house temperature, which is an unusual one. Um, I mean, Scotland doesn't have huge spikes in temperature, although it's happening more and more. I think we had a 30 degree day last year. Um, but yeah, just the different seasonality, obviously the different heat uh, in the still house um, is going to make a, a difference. Actually, another one that you could slip into there is pressure. Pressure is an unusual one. So uh, my friend Georgie Crawford, she was a distillery manager at Lagavulin. She's heading up the Port Ellen project now. One of the first things she did at Lagavulin is she figured out that these uh, air vents that were put into the still house for health and safety in the early 90s, what was happening is, is the wind, the kind of gusty West Coast breeze, is blowing over the roof of the still, uh, sorry, the roof of the uh, distillery. And it's creating a pressure vacuum and it's actually pulling air out of the still house and that's creating more pressure. So it's actually stripping alcohol uh, out of the stills as well. It's taking the alcohol vapor out. So by changing the ventilation in the still house, she managed to claim, I think it's something like an extra 100,000 liters of alcohol a year. And that's a distillery that was maxed out, was running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They don't want to expand it anymore because... You don't want to damage the characteristic of the, the, the site or the, the, the spirit, potentially. So she just figured out that changing the ventilation changed the pressure in the still house and the, uh, the efficiency improved. And I was like, ah, that's why you're the distillery manager of Lagavulin. And it's very, very clever stuff. Anyway, so that's just a, a few different things about how uh, the, the, the still shape and various elements can, can affect the, uh, the characteristic of the whiskey. There's an old saying, I think it originated from one of the Linkwood brand manage, uh, uh, distillery managers, that um, you don't even take a cobweb down uh, from a distillery because it, it risks changing the character. And you'll, you'll see that in certain stills as well, like Ardbeg. Ardbeg used to be made from three different sections, those stills, and you could see the copper rivets uh, where those, those three different parts were put together. The new stills aren't done like that. They're all one sheet. So what they've done is they've recreated where the rivets would have been. Even though there's no two sheets, it's one solid sheet of copper. They've, uh, they've recreated um, the divots because uh, the, the risk is that it might change the, the, the style of the, of the, of the whiskey and, and they, they don't want to do that at all. Anyway, we will keep going. So... Whiskey number six, uh, Sultana Barley Bread. So a lot going on in that name there. Sultana uh, is obviously referring to kind of fruity ester characters, orange-like, Sultana-like kind of uh, characteristics. Barley, so we're, we're talking about a whiskey that's quite cereal-rich. Uh, the bread notes as, as well, you could probably apply to that. And we're talking about another one of these Diageo flavor profiles again. So we've had grassy, um, we've had waxy. Uh, this is oily. This falls into the oily portfolio of uh, uh, Diageo, uh, and this is a Ben Rinnis distillery. 
Ben Rennes is another one of these juxtaposed whiskies where it can be quite fruity. I, I sometimes get quite a lot of lime notes in, in, in a Ben Rennes, especially if it's been in a bourbon cask, but then the body is quite oily and quite fatty. Um, and that's because they're using a worm tub. Uh, so they're using a coil to condense uh, the spirit from vapor back into liquid rather than shell and tube, which is more efficient. Um, I'm just double checking. I've got more questions coming up there. The sound is scratching a lot. Is this only my connection? Apologies if that's my um, my microphone. I'll, I'll try not to move around as much. And then somebody's just typed in zero free. I don't know what that means. So I'll leave that. I would combine Valentine with brownie and Basili ice cream. I think I would. it would go amazing together. As a tasting note, or actually, yeah, make that if you want. Chuck on some of the Glen Rothes. It'll make it even better, I guess. Uh, right, so uh, what have I got? Here we go, Ben Rennes. So that's the distillery site there. Um, it's, I think it's a six still distillery. It's kind of medium sized, uh, late, late in the 19th century production uh, when they rebuilt the distillery. And this diagram here on the right, that shows you what a worm tub is. So there's a pot still, and then you can see this coil. Traditionally, it would have been in a big wooden ton. A uh, ton is just a different word for a barrel, a larger barrel. Uh, and even if you go right back to early distillation, if you look at prohibition era distillation in America, it's quite common to see this barrel with the coil. It was just the simplest form of engineering to make something that was going to condense spirit back in, uh, condense vapor back into spirit. And you fill it with water. And uh, depending on the temperature of the water, you can change the characteristic of the whiskey as well. So if that water was a little bit warmer, it wouldn't be too efficient. So you would end up with more sulfury flavors i.e. a distillery like Craig Ellicke. Ben Rinnis runs the water very cold, so it's very efficient. It's very good at uh, getting that liquid back into, uh, back into uh, sorry, getting the vapor back into a state of liquid. Um, it doesn't actually have a coil like this. Um, it's quite hard to find a picture, but you can see in the distillery here, there's this weird kind of rectangle at the back that looks a little bit like a storage unit. And if you actually look above, you can see this is um, the water pipe and somewhere submerged underneath is uh, the actual condensing pipe. Uh, so rather than it being in a barrel, it's in a kind of long trough. Uh, I think Glen Kinchy has the same as well. Uh, and this, this is basically the, the, what's left of the worm tub uh, style of production that every distillery would have had 200 years ago. It's this kind of more engineered rectangular form. Um, a Luardnaho on Isla that I mentioned, they've gone back to the kind of beautiful old uh, ton barrels for, for their condensing. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's, uh, you can see the condensers outside, that's done for efficiency. You know, why spend loads on chilling the water when you just let the good old Scotch climate do that for you? Uh, although they'd be buggered if they get a 30 degree today, uh, again, like uh, last year. Um, but yeah, uh, that, that's essentially what's really helping create what we refer to as a meaty or oily characteristic in the whiskey. Um, I'll just give it a wee try. And your, your best test for this, again, is to look at the body. Um, so don't dilute it straight into the glass. And then you can look at the legs. And I would expect a worm tub distilled whiskey. It takes a while for the legs to actually form. So it might be a couple of seconds before they appear. And then once they appear, they just hug the side of the glass. The legs just don't move. Um, and that's because of that heavy body from the worm tub distillation. Go back to production. Um, I mean, this distillery is just bonkers. Um, it's partial triple distillation. Um, it's got descending line arms. Um, so it's capturing um, all of the vapor. It's, it's got all sorts of crazy things going on. I mean, I, again, it's too complicated. I, I could try I mean, I don't even fully understand it myself, but this is the partial triple distillation of Ben Rennes. Um, I mean, the low wines from the first distillation were split into strong and weak faints. So you've got strong and weak. You know, even the diagram doesn't work with that wording. The low strength portion was redistilled in the middle still and split into two again with stronger faints being carried forward and weaker being retained in the next charge. I'm already lost. Um, the strong faints were then mixed with the highest strength distillate from the wash stills and redistilled into the spirit stills. I've spent a bit of time with this diagram. It's not as complex as the Mortlach distillation process, although I've got a bit better grip on that one. 
Uh, ben Rinnis did this from 1974 to 2007. They, they've thankfully stopped now, so like any new Ben Rinnis, <laughs> we can just say it's double distilled. But this was a partially triple distilled uh, whiskey. There's not many out there like that. I think some of Springbanks are partially triple distilled. Um, Mortlach has a what it's called a 2.7 distillation through a slightly different process. And I think that's the only distilleries that do this very bizarre thing. E even each one of them do it in a very different way. And it was never it was never planned. It's just kind of organically happened over years as they've evolved stills and changed piping and all that kind of stuff. Basically, what it to simplify it right down because I I can't it's just too detailed and I, I I'd have to spend a day researching this to figure it fully out. What they're doing is rather so you, when when you distill. You, you cut, so you've got wastage. You've got the four shots, the, the wastage before you cut, and then you've got the fence, the, the wastage after you cut. You'd normally redistill that in the same still. They're taking that and they're putting it into a different still with different cuts and, and redistilling, and that's how they're ending up with this 2.7 distillation. I have no idea what it does to the character. Uh, who the hell could guess? I'm sure some engineer at Diageo could tell us. It's just absolute madness. Uh, I, I get completely lost looking at that. Um, but then on top of that, you've got um, ascending line arms. You've got the worm tub distillation. You know, for for a pretty uh, unknown distillery, there's a hell of a lot going on with Ben Rennes, Um and it does lead to a very very unusual character where you've got the very very sharp citrus notes light delicate notes but then a really kind of meaty oily spirit and meaty oily is always good for blending because that's going to build mouthfeel into the whiskey so distilleries like ben rinnis like dal ewan uh mortlach is quite meaty and heavy as well so you've got to be careful with mortlach and ben rinnis these are bodybuilders as in they, they build body mouthfeel in, into into a blend um but then when you have it as a single cask like we're having today you just get this really kind of unctuous mouth coating feel with the whiskey yeah it just covers and coats the tongue with a bourbon maturation like this it's where you end up with the terminology creamy because we've got that heavy mouthfeel, but then we've got all the, the vanillins from, from the bourbon cask coming through. So it it's ends up being what you call a creamy whiskey. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's whiskey number six, Sultana Barley Red. Number seven. So we are going back to Isla and with an actual defined distillery here, which is Bonaharbon, which I talked about a little bit earlier as well. Every independent bottler has a particular distillery that they've got excellent stock of. When I worked at Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, it was Glen Murray. We had epic stocks of Glen Murray. We had older casks of Glen Murray than Glen Murray had themselves. And that's because it was owned by Glen Morangy at the time. Um, and they owned the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. Um, Gordon McPhail are well known for things like the um, Glen Grants and their long ones. They've got excellent old stock of that. Um, we are very quickly getting known for our Bonnet Harbins. We, we have very good old stock. There's not many other independent producers that have the kind of archive of Bonnet Harbin stock that we have. And like I mentioned earlier, um, through the kind of variation in its history, each one's very, very different. You know, you can have sister casks that uh, were, were filled on the same day and one 63% still cash strength at 25 years old and it's almost black. And then the other one's much, much milder. Um, and again, it just comes down to those different cask types. The cool thing with our Bonner Harbins is almost all of them, when I've looked at the stock sheet, it's a bit of a pain in the ass, that they were actually all matured on Isla. So going right back to what I was talking about with uh, Dunnage, palletized, and racked warehousing, our casks actually sat in this warehouse here, Bonner Harbin warehouse number one. Um, that's now been knocked down. I was, I was at the distillery last year and they've knocked that down and I think they're going to make it a visitor centre. So that maybe explains why we've suddenly got a lot of Bonner Harbins because <laughs> we didn't have the building anymore uh, to store them. Um, but it's quite cool to know that, you know, those casks were matured on site. And there's various arguments about um, does maturing by the sea, does maturing locally to the distillery have an effect versus the casks that are matured on the mainland in Scotland? Because that's quite common. You know, not a lot of Isla distilleries actually mature all of their stock by the distillery or even on Isla. Uh, Kilhoman does, Brookladdy does, but almost all of them, you know, it's more likely that those barrels are sat in the central battle of Scotland 
than they are by the coast. Um, so there's, there's always talk about what's the difference from the climate and the different warehousing that's affecting it. Um, yeah, you, you need to have two samples that are definitely from those different orig origins. Um, Lefroy talk about it, say that, that, that John Campbell, he can, he can pick out the difference between a Lefroy that's been matured on, on, on the island versus a Lefroy that's been matured on the mainland. But I mean, he's surrounded by that stuff every day and can pick out all those amazing nuances, um, which is pretty impressive. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what the effect is. If, if, if there's a big, big difference, some again, like to hesitate, like to, hazard a guess is that's is that potentially where the saltiness comes in but i mean you can have so, this, this saltiness but it's been matured on the mainland uh so yeah it, it's just again it's one of these lovely magic unknowns in scotch uh if it was all understandable and science or known science then you know it would lose a little bit of it, its mystery and and, and and interest i think um but yeah so let's let's give this bonnet harbant a try this one's a sherry butt. Um, I actually have a full bottle of this here. Again, it's, this gives you a better example than the smaller bottle. Um, you can see color-wise when we're not into big, big, heavy sherry notes. Like I said earlier, we're, we're dealing with refill stock. We don't want just dumb fun here. You know, for a 1987 whiskey, I don't want it just to taste like treacle. I want spirit character. I want nuance. I want subtlety. And that's where you get these refill casks really uh, shining through. Um, I know that's a hard thing for some people because they, they love their, their big, heavy sherry, but I like salty. Um, so, yeah. uh, let's give this a try. I mean, there's still sherry character. You get it right away on the nose. There's a deeper richness, a kind of demerara sugar. Uh, there's also a slight kind of rubberiness. I wouldn't say it's full heavy sulfur. Um, there's a lot of writers out there that say that loads of sherry casks are tainted from, from sulfur treatment, but th there's not that many in reality. And actually, if you understand about production in whiskey, uh, sulfur occurs in fermentation. Uh, so a whiskey like Bonaharban, a whiskey like Craig Ellicky, uh, whiskey like Mortlach, they have high, high levels of sulfur compounds in their fermentation. Then they distill it and concentrate it. You get a different type of sulfur, sulfur dioxide. Um, I think that's what's coming from those cast treatments. Um, but yeah, that's that's not what we're getting here at all. Um, it's just more of a kind of meaty, earthy kind of characteristic coming through. Uh, and then we get the lovely kind of richer sugary notes from the sherry cask. Cask strength bottling this one as well, 48.1%. So we can see that ABV over 30 odd years. I mean, this whiskey is one year younger than me. Um, that ABV has come right down um, over those 30 odd years um, just to make something that's a little bit more softer and rounder and not in your face. But I've, I've seen another cask of Bonnerhaven the same as this, that's 63%, which is absolutely amazing that it kept that strength. It meant that the cask was filled at cash uh, at, um, at like spirit safe strength rather than filled strength so it's probably filled at 69 percent rather than 63.5 which is the most common in the whiskey industry um yeah you, you just stumble across these really unusual whiskies every once in a while um but yeah maritime's memories i mean there's a reason i've, I've got a bottle of this in my house because I'm, I'm a big fan of this whiskey it's just got a lovely mix of kind of subtle sherry and then you've got the maltiness there's almost like a sherbet note as well i mean it's it's livelier than the 30 years you would normally expect. And this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. You can't just, you can't expect an exact flavor from an exact age. Each cask moves at its own pace. And this one still has some vibrancy in it. That's, that's, that's really, really pleasant. Yeah. Amazing stuff. It's, yeah, it's, it's so nice. And then there's, there's this wisp of elusive smoke. It's not that it's peated, it's, it's the cask. Um, you sometimes, well, let, let's, let's throw this out there again as well. Have you ever had somebody drink a whiskey? You know that the whiskey isn't peated. You know, maybe it's a light space, maybe it's a space side or a highland. You know that it's not peated. And like, oh, I'm getting smoke on that. Have, have you ever had people come across that? Oh, yeah. Now, when I was an ignorant bartender in my first couple of years in the industry, I'd be like, no, it's not peated. You're not getting smoke at all. No, uh, that's not possible. It is possible. 
Uh, and what it is, is the, the biomass of peat um, has some of the same um, organic matter as the biomass of oak casks. So when we talk about peat, uh, you'll sometimes hear people say phenols. Um, phenol is a simplification. Uh, they're grouping together a lot of different uh, compounds. Eugenol, glycol, creosol. Um, these are different organic matters that give you everything from medicinal to wood smoke to um, uh, a kind of more peppery kind of note, a piney kind of note. They exist in peat because peat is biomass. It's all plants that have decomposed over time. So, you know, it's, of course that same matter is going to exist in oak. So then if you have a cask, casks have eugenol, have creosol, uh, have glycol in them as well. If you char that cask or if you've left it for maturation for 30, 40 years, then that stuff is going to present itself into the whiskey as well. I can sometimes spot the difference. It's still smoke, but to me it's more of, so a, a cask-derived smoke is more like a cigar. It's more of a kind of tobacco-y, woody kind of smoke, whereas smoke derived from peat now it depends on where in Scotland it comes from, has more of that kind of medicinal note. And if we do want to talk about regionality in whiskey, if you're using local peat, then yes, there is. You know, the peat in Orkney has uh, a lot more carbohydrate, has a lot more plant matter in it, uh, and less eugenol than the peat uh, from Isla that doesn't have the Isla didn't have any trees either, but um, it doesn't have as much heather in it. Um, so different parts of Scotland do have different peat sauces with slightly different flavour. Um, but the smoke that I get in this is cask-derived smoke, and that's probably just from the fact that it's been in this old sherry butt for 30-odd years that we're, we're getting this kind of wood tannin smoke, uh, the creosols and the eugenols from there. And, it, yeah, it comes through in the finish, um, but it's, it's, more, yeah, it's more like a cigar than anything, I would say, in my opinion. Amazing stuff. It's still really nice and sweet though as well. That, that Demerara sugar sweetness that's coming through from that, that, that sherry cask maturation. It's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful whiskey. That's, that's, that's right up my street. Um, anything else to talk about on Bunna Harbin? Uh, I mean, you'll see there, and we talked about earlier, these are the kind of pear-shaped, uh, the, the middle-aged stills. <laughs> They're kind of wider at the, uh, wider at the waist. Um, there's, there's very little chance of reflux. There's no reflux bulbs in there. Um, although they, they aren't lacquered, they're pretty grubby looking things. Um, but you can see on the second photo here, you can see that um, they've done something to help build some estuary character, some lighter character into the stills. And that's by having that uh, ascending rather than descending or straight line arm. That photo is taken from up high, so it looks like the line arms are going down. You get a better idea from this picture here. The line arms are ascending slightly. So you are going to get a little bit of uh, reflux happening and uh, development of, of character. And obviously you've got shell and tube condensers, pretty big shell and tube condensers. So that's going to help give you some of the lighter style as well. So Bonner's got a bit of body to it, but it's not like a fatty, fatty, oily whiskey. Um, it still has a little bit of a prickle and, and life to it. Even after 31 years in a cask. Yeah, and wow, absolutely amazing stuff. Okay, uh, I think I was going to go on a rant about water and whiskey at this point, but I'll, I'll maybe move past that because I know we've gone over time a little bit. Um, I suppose I just one of the points I wanted to make because I knew when we're starting to talk about Islas and Bunna uh we'd need to start talking about salt and whiskey, which I mentioned a little bit there as well. Just because the salty water or hard water or Bunnaharbin, it's uh, it pulls its water. God, I just forgot the name of the water source. If someone knows it, just chuck it in the chat. Um, but they say that that's PT water. PT water doesn't mean that you're going to end up with PT whiskey. Um, peat flavored water it doesn't taste like peat. It, it just tastes like mud. It's only the burning, only the burning of the peat underneath the barley that's going to give you the phenol, phenol the creosol, the glycol. Because the problem is, any mineral content in the water is going to stay behind. Now, the mineralic content could help the fermentation. If any of you are beer brewers, uh, you'd know this, uh, the difference between soft water and hard water. Uh, things like uh, sodium, I've got their sodium sulfates and chloride, they actually help accentuate flavors 
I think it's sulfates help accentuate hop flavors in beer, where uh, chloride kind of helps uh, accentuate the malty cereal notes. Um, so it could have a little bit of a play in the fermentation development, but those specific minerals aren't staying. It's Once it's distilled, they're left behind. Um, so we don't get development of salt or smoke um, from the water. The, the main thing with water is it's got to be potable. It's got to be drinkable. It's got to be good quality and you've got to have enough of it because you're not just using it. We, we call it process water. Process is, is the, you know, you're actually using the water to make the thing that you're going to drink. Um, but you have production water, so that's for cooling towers, um, for the gener- for for the boiler. Um, you know, the, you need much more water than just the output of the distillery into what you're going to drink. Um, so most of the distilleries that are built around Scotland were built by good water sources, and you just had to make sure that you know there's, there's a reason why there's not a lot of distilleries in cities uh, during the Victorian era because the water just would have been tainted and polluted and probably give you cholera uh, but then if you distill it drink beer then then you're okay but you want a good pure water and that's why we ended up with a lot of uh, distilleries out in Speyside and on the islands and the highlands also what they were doing were illegal so you know you want to be far away from the law uh, so that's why we end up with a lot of distilleries on islands back in the day anyway so last whiskey um but we got there <laughs> uh, we're getting there um so this last one's a little bit unusual. I really uh, not loved distillery by some people. I think it's a very interesting distillery. Um, if I go back right to the beginning of when I started doing tasting panels 10 years ago, I know I knew certain people in the industry that wouldn't touch Loch Lomond's uh, distillery. They had heard all sorts of horror stories about its production, all sorts of weird stuff. It's all overblown. All it is, any controversy that comes from Loch Lomond, is the fact that they have these stills, they have Lohman stills. Loch Lomond's not named after the Lohman stills, it's named after Loch Lomond the Loch, which is also its water supply. So it's the only distillery that's named after its water supply and the fact that it has stills named Lohman stills is, yeah, a bit going on there. These stills, they're not continuous stills, they're not what's used to make grain. They've still got the batch pot, so it's one batch that goes into them, but then it doesn't just have a standard neck what they have is uh, plates. So theoretically, these are adjustable. I mean, these things probably haven't been adjusted in years. They, they've, they've gone to four plate and just left them at that. Um, but theoretically, it means you can adjust them and you can add more plates and increase the reflux. So you can build variation into your distillery. Problem is the Scotch Whiskey Association, the people who um, interpret European law of uh, what Scotch whiskey is and a kind of apply rules and guidance. Um, they deem that single malt whiskey has to be made in a pot still, not in a Loman still. So the the uh, the Lot Loman Distillery just basically ignore them. So they they make single malt in Loman stills, and it's not supposed to be called single malt, but they just call it single malt anyway. It gets really complicated. There's eleven stills at Loch Lomond. Some of them are pot stills. You see at the back pot stills there but then a lot of them are these Lohman stills and they are not the most forthcoming in telling you which stills are used for what um crofting gear which we're drinking as our eighth dram this almost certainly uses Lohman stills um there's only one of the different spirit styles at Loch Lomond that doesn't use uh Lohman stills uh which is called Inchmurin uh Inchmurin always uses just pot um, so it's likely that this has been made in Lomond and pot stills, a combination of the two. This is also the most heavily peated of the spirit styles that are produced at Loch Lomond. So what they're doing with this is they're, they're making it for blending. Um, when you make a good blend, you want 5 to 10% smoky whiskey in there. It's not adding a huge amount of smoke. What it's doing is it's adding length to the whiskey. The, the longer the time is going to, the longer the flavors are going to stay in your mouth. Um, and it's also kind of turning up the dial. Uh, it's going to amplify some of the other flavors that are there because you've just got this punchy, peppery smoke coming through. It just lifts everything. Uh, so a good blender knows just to use a little bit of uh, smoky whiskey. So that's why they were producing this at Loch Lomond for when they're making uh, their kind of budget blends that go to Europe. But bottled as a single malt, bottled as a single cask, it's drinkable. It's nice. It's, it's un- unusual. It's not the Isla smoke that we're used to. It's 
it's a it's a different region of smoke. Um, you know, we've got Highland Park with its kind of heavy, milder smoke. We've got the Islas with their medicinals, and then we've got something like Ardmore. Um, but Lot Loman, suddenly we've got a whole other different style of smoky whiskey. It's kind of carbolic, very woody kind of smoke that comes through. Um, I've got a couple of hands that have been raised. Um, I think that might mean there's questions. Uh, what was my name again? <laughs> oh, I've been talking for an hour and a half, yeah. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself properly. Uh, my name is Stephen Shand, not Ben Stewart. Ben Stewart is uh, the owner of the Zoom account that I'm currently stealing. Um, why are older grain whiskies usually cheaper than older malt whiskies? That is because they are cheaper to produce. Um, they are produced on very large scale, on continuous stills, not in batch. And if you remember, I was talking about the strength earlier on. Um, if you get right up to 94.5%, but then you're filling at 63, you're diluting. So you're stretching the batch of your distillation out by more. So you're making it much more efficient. That's why those stills were made in the first place. You know, you, you've got much higher concentration, which is higher yield. You're not drinking the whiskey at 95%, you're drinking it at 40 or 46. So by diluting it down, you end up with more. Also, you're not just using barley, you're chucking in large quantities. Today, it's, it's mainly wheat, although uh, uh, Invergordon uses a large amount of uh, maize, corn in there as well. You still have to have a bit of barley for the enzymes for, to start the fermentation. Um, but, um, uh, sorry, not the fermentation, the uh, sacrification of the sugars. Um, but yeah, it, it's just it's a larger economical, economical scale with cheaper ingredients, a higher concentration. So they, they will always be cheaper than single malts. And we bottles, I mean, Invergordon, I, I, I'll put Invergordon, it's a grain whiskey, that's in my top 10, easily. Invergordon is amazing kind of popcorn-y, butterscotch kind of flavors coming through. And we bottle, uh, we bottle some 31-year-olds and UK retail, maybe 120 pounds. Compare that to 30-year-old single malt, you double that. So yeah, you get them at a much more affordable price. I think a good explanation of this, um, if I jump back into my slides. So that's your Loman still there. It's not a column still. That's a column still. So on the right-hand side, we've got the old kind of Victorian plate still. It's two parts, you call it an analyzer. So that part there is the analyzer. And then that's the rectifier. Um, and these were first designed, uh, if I talk about the Higgs and the Steins again, these kind of whiskey mafia. What they realized is, is not only are they getting a better concentration, is back in the 1820s and 1830s, the government taxed you every time you charged the still. So literally every time you switched it on, you had to pay a fee to the government. With a continuous still, you only switch it on once. So you only pay that fee once, and then you just keep it running for as long as you can, weeks, months. So you actually avoid costs, uh, additional costs. So that's where people really came, fell in love with the continuous still. And that was, again, the, the Higgs and the Steins kind of outsmarting uh, HMRC and their own rules and regulations. Um, but then you just get that amazing yield. Um, this picture here on the left, I mean, it's just unbelievable to look at. That, that's Girvan Distillery. Uh, that's on the southwest coast of Scotland. Um, so that stuff that they're making there would end up in, uh, God, um, God, my brain's drawn a blank. What on earth is that blank? Grant's, Grant's uh, whiskey. But actually, the, you know, the seven grain distilleries in Scotland, just like single malts, it's bought, bought and sold. So Girvan, which is owned by William Grant's, that liquid will probably end up in Diageo's Johnny Walker and uh, Bell's, uh, uh, sorry, in, in, in uh, Bacardi's whiskeys as well. Um, it's kind of all bought and swapped and sold. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the big difference uh, between... Um, grain production and pot distillation. And I mean, you just see that diagram, I uh, saw that picture, there's, there's five different analyzers and rectifiers in there because they've got to do something called hydroselective analyzation to strip out the fusel oils. So it's a very, very complex process, um, but it's on a huge scale. So you just end up with a, a much cheaper liquid at the end of it. Um, I think most of those stills are all just producing um, whiskey spirit. Um, they could make neutral grain spirit for making gin and vodka, but they, they, the capacity is maxed out on whiskey. So actually most of the neutral grain spirit that we use to make Scottish or British gins and vodkas comes from France. Um, comes from like Calais and stuff like that. A big grain distilleries there. Anyway, um, 
if there are any other questions there, I think I'll, I'll just keep going. Um, the picture is wrong. That's too vague. I don't know which picture. There's probably a lot of pictures that are wrong. Anyway. Um, yeah, so Lot Lomans, we've got 70 hour fermentation, so kind of medium fermentation times, uh, very, very heavily peated, and um, this Lomans distilled kind of character. Um, and then the peat sauce, I'm guessing it's coming from the Highlands, not from Isla. So we just get a very different kind of smoke character. This is our youngest whiskey of the eight that we're trying. It's only 12 years old, so we've hopefully still got a good punchiness in that smoke. But we just thought it was a nice, unusual one because you're probably familiar with Isla peat, um, but maybe not as familiar with uh, the Loch Lomond smoke. Yeah, it's very kind of woody, burnt, kind of barbecue-y kind of characteristic going on in that whiskey. Very enjoyable. Cool. Um, so that is the eight whiskeys and a lot of other chat about various things. Um, thank you all for staying on and listening to me on your Friday night. Apologies that we um, took a little bit longer to get started. Um, if you guys want to stick around, you're welcome to and keep asking me some questions for a wee while. I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for trying these. Um, Hopefully, if you enjoy them, they are available. If you speak to uh, the Whiskey DK folks, um, they will be able to sort you out. Um, there's some excellent whiskeys here. Yep, they're not all sherry bombs, uh, as somebody mentioned before. It's more about nuance and spirit style, and that's that's what interests me in our whiskeys. Um, yeah, so what have we got here? Ah, picture wrong, Ailsa Bay. Is that Ailsa Bay? I don't think that is Ailsa Bay. I'll, I'll need to double check that. Because Ilse Bay is pot stills, is it not? Has it maybe got grain? I was, I was pretty sure that was Gervin. Um, I'll, I'll need to double check and see. But they're, they're definitely column stills regardless. And they're, they're definitely from uh, the southwest of Scotland. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Fuck, I'm pissed. Told you not to drink all eight of them at once, didn't I? But you're Danish. <laughs> Um, right, uh, wrong picture, mate. My guest, too. I'm Peter Kalila, so that's it on the chat. Um, what is your favorite whiskey? Now, I've already kind of said what my favorite Scottish distillery is. I mean, the problem is there's so many different whiskies out there, and you get different limited releases and things that can be really enjoyable. But my, my go to scotch is Kalila, however. If I had to pick one, and this might be controversial, controversial. If I had to pick one whiskey spirit that to me is just really unusual, really stands out, um, and I love it every time I try it, is Yuichi. Uh, Yuichi is uh, the Makasaka Tekasuru distillery uh, that was built in Hokkaido in the north of Japan in the 1920s. Uh, I think Yamazaki beat them to it. They weren't the first uh, uh, Scotch style uh, distillery in Japan, but uh, they're one of my favorites. And the cool thing about Yuichi is it's like a time capsule of Scottish distillation. They still directly coal fire, you know, chuck coal into the stills or below the stills even to create hot spots and heat them up. Um, there's distilleries like Glenfarclas and Ardmore in Scotland where that was kind of uh, outlaws due to health and safety in I think the early 90s. Ardmore gave it up in 2001. Um, but yeah, it's this little time capsule and, you know, people talk about Japanese whiskey. To me, Japanese whiskey is just the sixth Scottish region. Uh, you had Japanese distillers coming over to Scotland. They learned their chemistry here. They worked at Campbelltown distilleries. Um, Max Akatexuru Mac did that. He married a Glaswegian woman and they decided to move back to Japan and build a distillery there. Um, and they built it up in the north to replicate um, the Scottish climate. Um, I'm also guessing there was some tension there about bringing a Western woman back to Japan during the rise of Imperial Japan. So they're a bit more up north and uh, in kind of outlaw country. Um, but yeah, I love that distillery. Um, do you have much experience of American whiskey? I mean, we don't blend it. We don't bottle it. Um, I was in America last year um, and I got to spend a bit of time in Kentucky. Um, so yeah, where did I go? I went to Four Roses. Um, I went to Buffalo Trace where I got to go into the bottling line at Blanton's. That blew my mind. There's like 
10 people with the headphones on, you're not allowed to speak to them, and they're hand bottling the Blantons, and they got this stainless steel bat in each corner, and they're open, and Blantons are bottled cash strength. So the room is just alcohol vapor as soon as you walk in. Like, they'll bring a tear to your eye. You'll get drunk just smelling the vapor. And these guys are working in there eight hours a day at least. Um, but yeah, that, that was really cool. Um, I got to go to Wild Turkey and meet Jimmy Russell. So Jimmy Russell, I think, is the oldest living distiller in America. Uh, he started distilling in the 1950s, and it's, I think it's his grandson that's running the site now. And Buff, uh, sorry, um, Wild Turkey is a massive site. They had like a tour bus that took us around. It's huge. And then we got to the, the, the gift shop at the end, and Jimmy Russell's just sat outside drinking in a Negroni. <laughs> uh, maybe a Bovardier, maybe it was a uh, whiskey and Campari. And remove, but yeah, he's just outside chilling. This like eight year old legendary distiller, and just got to sit outside and like pick his brains and, and chat to him for a while. He's retired, but he just likes hanging around the distillery and chatting to people who go and visit. Uh, so that that was really cool. Uh, yeah, um, and I like some of the experimental distilleries in America. Balcones, I'm in the right mood. Their uh, blue corn or their uh, brimstone, which isn't peated, it's smoked. Uh, they smoke the liquid. Um, yeah, really interesting stuff in the states. Um, I. I, I I don't don't limit myself to just one style. I, I work in Scotch. I still think Scotch is the gold standard, but whiskey is international. Uh, I've not tried any Danish whiskey yet. I know you guys have got a few distilleries. My, my family is Swedish, actually, so that might be controversial. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've had a, I've had a few different Swedish whiskeys that I thought were very interesting as well. Um, but yeah, uh, so which one of these is your personal favourite? Um, ooh, that is a good question. So the ones I would put on top. The Bladnock's good, the Klein Leash is good, and the Maritime Memories. Are my, so that's my top three. It's going to have to be the Bladnock because that, that Rancio influence, that really unusual, overripe, kind of lychee flavor, um, it reminds me of German wine, uh, like uh, or, um, Alsace wine in France, like the Wurztraminer. It's got that kind of uh, almost petrolic, exotic fruit kind of aroma to it. It's, it's a really, really lovely stuff. So, yeah, I would say my favorite is Coconut Raspberry Snowball from Bladnock. What I'll try and do, uh, I made these earlier, but as you can obviously tell, um, the technology side of this has not been great today. We did make some pulls. Um, let's see if I can get this to work. Which was your favorite whiskey launch pull? So hopefully there's a poll that you can fill out now and you guys get to vote on which of your, or which of these eight you found to be your favorite. Um, yes, it's working. People are voting. Maritime Memories, Isle of Porridge. Interesting. Got one other person who likes the Bladnock. See, I actually kept, the Bladnock's been kept in the glass uh, where all the others got chucked into my, what we call overflow vessel in a uh, blending. Maritime Memories, the Klein Leash is up there as well. It looks, I mean, eight out of 21 people have voted, so it's, it's not, um, it's not a high turnout. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the Maritime's Memories looks like it's, uh, it's working well. Uh, right, I've had a few people raise hands. Uh, I don't know if that means there's questions. Um, have you tried any Danish whiskey? Uh, I haven't yet. Um, if you've got any recommendations, do let me know. Um, last time, I've, I've been to Denmark three times, but I haven't been oh, in like four or five years now. Um, so there's probably been some stuff that's innovated and, and come out since the last time I've been in Denmark. Um, but yeah, let me know. Uh, Fairy Locken. Is that the name of a distillery? Sounds like a bar lady in a kind of highland pub fairy locken i'll check that out hopefully that is actually a distillery i don't want to get into trouble googling random things uh, fairy locken makes excellent whiskey def give it a try what is your favorite whiskey uh that's whiskey with an e um so that's throwing me right off uh whiskey without an e is scotch uh whiskey with an e is irish or american uh let's go irish uh cooley uh, Cooley is um, an amazing whiskey. Um, they also produce Connemara, which is their peated. Um, but if you get Cooley, um, it's one of those whiskeys where you taste it and you're like, how the hell is this just barley water and yeast? It tastes like 
Hubba Bubba ice cream, just huge amounts of exotic fruit character in there. And that's what I'm really looking forward to with King's Bonds. So our, our distillery is quite young. Um, we're just, you know, I, I think if we could bottle, we could bottle five-year-olds, but we're already getting exotic fruit notes in our spirit uh, at three or four years old. So that's where I'm really interested to see what the character of King's Bonds is going to be like in 10 years' time, because we could be you know, punching weight for weight with uh, Cooley in terms of just the intensity of the mango, papaya, passion fruit kind of notes that, that are coming through from these really advanced esters um, in the whiskey. Um, something to say about Weems that many doesn't know. A crazy story. God. I have to have a think. Let me, let me come back to that one. Uh, there's nothing that's jumping to mind. I mean, I've got stories, but I don't know if they're specifically. <laughs> uh, what do you think about red breast Irish whiskey? Lovely. Uh, there's quite a few different ranges of red breast now. I think it's a blend. Um, so, I mean, it might even have some of the coolie that I was talking about in there. Um, but yeah, red breast is very, very smooth. Um, and again, a lot of those kind of exotic fruit notes. I know that they did some Lustau. Uh, Lustau is a sherry bodega. They did some good Lustau releases a couple of years ago that were seeking out. Uh, what distillery should I visit? Should you come visit King's Barns? Uh, King's Barns is only about an hour away from Edinburgh, and it's a nice little quaint small distillery. Um, it really depends what you're into. Um, I mean, is it the production? Is it where? For me, for me, if I'm going to a distillery, I want to get into the warehouse. Obviously, speaking to somebody who knows what they're talking about in terms of production. Uh, so you really get to understand the nuances of what's creating the spirit like we've been talking about in the last, or I've been talking about for the last couple of hours. Um, but getting into a warehouse and cracking open some casks, um, to me, that's like benchmark. I love doing that. Lagavulin, um, they still do a warehouse tasting on a Tuesday or Thursday, or when they open back up, they will do. And they've got some unbelievable casks that they basically they've paid the duty for um you, they're never going to bottle them um they're there specifically just for the tours and the tour guide Ian, if he's still doing it he has like a super old cask it's probably about 40 years old now but like i was saying earlier it's busted it's it's no good it's it's oxidized it's flat it's probably below 40 percent alcohol um so when people queue up at the end and it's like who wants a 40 year old everyone's like yeah, yeah, yeah. and but the people he likes he kind of tells them no 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 go for the 32 year old instead um, but yeah, Lagavulin has a legendary warehouse tasting. Um, oh God, there's, there's just so many. It really depends on what style that you like. Um, the one thing I'd say that's good about coming to King's Barns is that although you've got King's Barns spirit, because Weems uh, owns it, it's a great kind of Weems mecca. Um, we've got a lot of open bottles of our different single casks. We've got a lot of our different blended malts there as well. We have another gin cottage. So if you wanted to spend the first half of the day with whiskey, you can, and then the second half of the day, you can go and learn about gin. You can actually go distill your own bottle of gin as well. So that's well worth checking out. Um, there's lots of new distilleries popping up. Uh, Holyrood in Edinburgh, which is a new site, which is very, very interesting. Um, there's some that I've still been meaning to get to, but I've not managed yet. Glen Farquhar is supposed to be an excellent distillery to visit. Um, I'd like to go to some of the more northern distilleries as well. I'd love to go to Highland Park and Orkney, but it's not the easy, easiest place to pop and visit. Um, so yeah, uh, there's, there's, there's too many, too many to, 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 to decide in Scotland. Yes, I got that. In Scottish. <laughs> so, uh, what is the most expensive bottle you have tasted and that you truly liked? Well, that's two different questions. Uh, I think the most expensive whiskey I've tried is Macallan M. Um, and it was a kind of under the table illegal sample. <laughs> So I didn't pay for it. Um, but I think that bottle was quite an expensive bottle when it came out. Um, yeah, it was okay. It was nice. It's cherry pass pal. It's okay. I don't think I'd pay for the full bottle. Um, someone will. Um, yeah, it was nice stuff. Um, most expensive I truly liked. Oh, I mean, again, I could go back to Smoky Nectar. Because um, that's, you know, it's not in the thousands. I think it's like a £350 bottle. 35 years old. Um, you know, it's, it's quite a hefty budget for myself, um, but I really, really enjoyed that older Kalila. Uh, beautiful stuff. Um, unfortunately, I don't get to try vast amount of older expensive whiskey. But to be honest, 
someone gave me two thousand pounds to spend on whiskey, I wouldn't buy a two thousand pound bottle. I would buy ten, fifteen, a hundred, two hundred pound bottles. Um, I think the more there's more variety, there's more interest in whiskey that's not forty years old. So I think it's it's far more interest and variety in flavor in whiskey from five to fifteen years old. Um, that's what I would do with the money. Uh, what is your favorite whiskey? Somebody is, just keeps asking this question. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say again, Khalila. <laughs> Don't ask me again. <laughs> Keep asking me, expecting a different answer, maybe. Um, yeah, right, cool. If anyone's got any other questions, or oh, the poll, uh, yeah, the poll is definitely settled on maritime memories. Um, only four votes, so, you know, it's not, um, it's not a definite winner, but uh, yeah. Again, it's just down to what you like, I suppose. Um, cool. I'll give it a couple more minutes. Um, it is pretty late for you guys as well. You, you're an hour ahead of us. Um, and drank a lot of whiskey, probably. Oh, what's your favorite Speyside distillery? That's a good one. Longmorn. Longmorn is my favorite. Uh, Longmorn is, again, similar to Linkwood, which is also one of my favorites. Uh, is a really underrated distillery. Um, they've tried a few, Shivers have done a few things trying to brand it and launch it, but the reality is only about 2% of it's going to single malt. The other 98% of it is being kept for blends because the blenders know how good it is. And it's what you refer to as a top dresser, uh, a top note whiskey. Um, you add a decent amount of that. Uh, it's probably the largest quantity of single malt in the blend because it's just so excellent. Longmorn, I describe it as a brandy like, you know, there's not, there's not one definable, you know, it's not like, oh, there's pear or there's lots of vanilla. It's very harmonized and rounded and, and brandy like. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoy Longmorn. I, I would definitely seek that out. They've got official releases, but most independent bottlers will get hold of Longmorn. And there's a nice variety in the cast types from refills to first old bourbons to some unbelievable sherry casks as well. So I would definitely seek that distillery out if you have not tried it before. Uh, Lomond, like Loch Lomond, right? Yes. So um, Loch Lomond is named after Loch Lomond, the loch. Uh, it's where it gets its water source from. So it's built nearby it. Um, but then also, coincidentally, it has Lomond stills, um, which although it's the same name, they don't bear any relation. Um, it was also, if you read Tintin, um, Captain Haggard, Haddock used to drink Loch Lomond, which is interesting because Tintin was wrote in the 1920s and the distillery wasn't built until the 1960s. So unless Captain Haggard was a time traveler, um, somebody just made up the name, the writer, I forgot the name, the writer for Tintin, the Belgian guy, but uh, yeah, he just made up the name Loch Lomond as a single malt and uh, coincidentally, 60 or 40 odd years later, um, they built the distillery lot woman. Yeah. Um, right, folks. Um, I might try unmute you all and see if that just gives it a bit of chatter. I'm getting a bit paranoid just me speaking. I'm not hearing anybody else. <laughs> uh, see if this works at all. Uh, I've unmuted people, so if they do want to chat, they can. Uh, no, nope, I think that's it. Um, well, tell you what, guys, what I'll do, can I write in here? Uh, I'm going to write my email address. So if anyone does have any other questions, be it about Wien's Malts, about King's Barnes Distillery, about production, about blending, just about whiskey in general, give me a shout. Um, just drop me a line, um, stephen at weensmalts.com. Uh, try to chuck it in into the Q&A. It's not turned up. Interesting. Having all sorts of tech problems today. Um, yeah, um, yeah, Stephen with a V at weansmalts.com or you can find me on Facebook as well. I've got a company Facebook, um, so just please feel free to add me on there. I think some of you have already. Um, yeah, and if you just got any questions, I'll, 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 I might not be able to answer them like right that second, 
um, but within a day or two, I can get back to you and, uh, and, and answer them if you like. Um, I hope you found this informative, not too boring. It is a little bit more of an advanced tasting than a kind of introductory tasting, but I rightly saw when we're trying some really, really exquisite um, older single cast whiskies. I did focus a little bit more on the production rather than just my interpretation because at the end of the day, everybody can interpret whiskey in their own way. I think it's interesting to learn about, about the production and, and where these flavors actually come from. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll just have a quick check if there's any other Q&A questions. Uh, no, that seems to be it. So, um, oh, I've got raised hands. I don't know if that's questions or just saying hi. Um, or buy, <laughs> but yeah, I'll. Um, I think we'll, we'll give it a call it quits at this. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for for joining the tasting, and hope you enjoyed the whiskies um, or will enjoy the whiskies if you haven't tried them already. And like I said, definitely give the guys at Whiskey DK a shout if you're interested in any of these single casks. Uh, we have other products out there as well, uh, other single cask whiskeys, uh, blended malt. Uh, we'll probably do a blended malt tasting at some point. And uh, there's King's Bonds. And yeah, I hope once all the craziness is over that I could get back over to Denmark. I love going to Denmark, uh, go to Baila, uh, go to Copenhagen, um, and hopefully get to do some tastings over there uh, in person. Um, they get a little bit more fun. The whiskey gets splashed around. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Um, and like I said, give me a shout on email or Facebook if you've got any other questions. But uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Oops, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yes, was that you, Lisa? Mm -hmm. oh, no. no, I just wanted to say thank, thank you for a very nice evening. It no was, problem. Thank you. Um, to use all your stories and brands and everything. Good. Uh, glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, sorry, there wasn't a lot of anecdotes. It was more just production. Um, but it's, it's what's in my head at the time, yeah. what I want to talk about. Um, Nearly in a lovely way. Good. What's your opinion on using colouring in whiskies? So we've got another question that's coming. <laughs> uh, that's kept me going. Uh, colouring, so uh, when we refer to colouring, we refer to caramel colouring, uh, E150A. In Scotland, there are different types of E150. Uh, there's E150A, E150B, E150C, and D. B, C, and D have a taste. If you drank them, if you mix them into a drink, they have a flavour. So E150, B, C, and D can be used in some rums, for example, or some rum liqueurs. You get this very kind of artificial vanilla flavour off of them, a caramelly flavour. E150A that's used for scotch. I'm not going to say it's flavorless, but in the, in the quantity that's added, you can't detect it. Now, I've actually tasted E150 straight because I was stupid. Um, we had a bottle of it up in Elgin when I was doing some training. And I was like, I'm going to try this because I want to settle this argument once and for all. I tasted it. it. tastes like drinking shampoo. It is so bitter, so acrid, so soapy that... You know, and that's because you're tasting an extreme concentrate. The amount that goes into a vat for blending is minuscule. If you have a hundred thousand liter vat, it's like a capful that's going in. It's it's not a lot. Um, there are certain brands. I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to name them. People who drink whiskey will know when people talk about this. There's one Highland brand in particular, which gets really uh, a lot of stigma where everyone's like, oh, I can taste the caramel in it. It's so heavily caramel colored. It's sweet. It's cloying. If it was a lot of caramel color, it wouldn't taste like that. It would taste bitter. Um, what you're tasting is sherry cast maturation. Maybe you're tasting um, a large quantity of sherry uh, still in the cask, potentially. They're not supposed to do that. They're supposed to fully empty the cask. But you're definitely not tasting E150A. Um, unless you're drinking it straight from the bottle, you're not going to taste it. So then the argument comes down to, is it truthful? Is what you're doing, making your whiskey look darker, the right thing to do? Are you making it look like a sherry cask when actually it's in a refill cask? The reality in Scotland is uh, not many people are doing that. Um, the rules that are governed by the SWA is that, uh, that caramel colouring is supposed to be for consistency. And actually, from my experience, where I've seen it being used most, isn't in dark whiskey, it's in light whiskey. It's harder to keep light whiskey consistent naturally. So that's where you add a small amount. 
and you have what's called the EBC index. I've forgotten what it stands for, but your EBC index ranks from zero to 40. And that is, uh, you know, 40 would be the darkest, zero would be clear. Um, and what you've got to do is you've got to match your work to one specific EBC index. So certain single malt distilleries that have a lighter spirit, they'll use it to keep the consistency because it's much, much harder. Saying that, I have seen producers, and it's actually usually independent bottlers, um, that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was actually, I was in Taiwan, and it was a single grain whiskey from a refill barrel, and the thing was almost purple, it was so dark. Um, so they clearly just cut way too much E150 into there. Um, we've used it a little bit in some of our blended malts. Again, it's for consistency. We're moving away from it. Um, the problem I find is it goes back to that original question. Why are your whiskeys all so light? If people are expecting, sorry, I didn't mean it in that kind of condescending way. Uh, not all, it's, it's a, it is a relevant question. Um, People have this expectation from sherry casks or overly colored whiskies that all whiskey should be this really, really dark color. And actually most Isla whiskies, for example, are very, very light. Um, they don't want to put them in well in very heavy influence casks. It's going to take out all the smoke or mask all the smoke. Um, it's just there's a bit of stigma with light whiskey. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky, tricky debate. And it's, it, there's reasons it's, it's still there, but... It should, if it is used, it should only ever be used for keeping consistency, in my opinion. It shouldn't be used to darken a whiskey uh, and make it look like it's something it's not, because that's not, that's not a good uh, thing to do to kind of pull the wool over people's eyes. Um, but, but also saying that I don't think it should be outlawed. It does serve a purpose. Um, I assume most of the people that are sat on a single cast whiskey tasting have a level of understanding and expertise. But if, you know, I've, I've heard of meetings where, where people have gone to a big supermarket supplier and they've pulled out their natural colored whiskey and the supplier and the, uh, the supermarket buyer has gone like, oh, that's a bit pale. But whiskey was supposed to be darker because that person's used to buying baked beans and chocolate biscuits and, and whiskey. They just, there's this expectation of what a whiskey color is. And if you're trying to put a light Roland whiskey in there, things bonds or Kalila, one of the best distilleries in the world, but it has a light spirit. Um, some buyers will be put off by it. So it, it depends on the customer. That's, that's a tricky thing. Anyway, sorry, that's a very long, long answer to E150. Uh, or caramel coloring, as it's also called. Sorry to hold you up. Any thoughts on Japanese definition of whiskey? I'm going to make an assumption as to what this is about because it's becoming a hot button issue. Um, oops. So Japanese whiskey, if it just says Japanese whiskey, that's actually right. unless, unless it says single malt Japanese whiskey, theoretically it could have Irish, Scotch, Canadian whiskey in it. What the Japanese uh, larger companies do is they buy large vats of Scotch whiskey in some cases, the Japanese companies actually own the Scotch distilleries. Uh, ben Nevis is an example. Uh, Beaumont is another example. They're actually owned by Japanese companies. So they will buy uh, tankered uh, whiskey uh, and they will tanker it from Scotland to Japan. Can't be bottled as a single malt. Single malt has to be bottled in Scotland, but a blended Scotch doesn't have to be bottled in Scotland. So those vats get sent over to Japan. And that was a good way of bulking out their stock. The thing is now that Japan, Japanese whiskey has got so, so popular that it's become an issue because it wasn't an issue 15 years ago, but it's an issue now because people think that all Japanese whiskey is outstanding. And then to find out that their Suntory blend probably has more Irish and Canadian whiskey in it than it does Japanese would rightly piss people off. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're definitely wanting to try Japanese whiskey and want 100% to know it's Japanese whiskey, single malt, it's got to say single malt. But I'm not saying that all blends from Japan aren't got, that don't have Japanese whiskey in them as well. You would just have to talk to, um, which I'm not some Japanese whiskey expert. I think there's even some diagrams online um, that show a kind of tree of uh, explanation as to which ones are Japanese and which aren't. Um, it's some of the madness of the popularity in, in, you know, in a very short, you know, 10 years isn't long. Um, it's a very short period of time that 
Japanese whiskey has got that popular. And whiskey's a long game. It's a slow game. It takes a long time to mature. It takes a long time to get a bottling done. Uh, retailers will know it can take a long time to sell a bottle. It can sit on a shelf a long time, but you've got to do that because you've got to have a variety. Whiskey is a long game and uh, 10 years isn't long in Japan. It's having to kind of figure out what it can do and what it can release. Um, and part of that is this, this uh, blending of international whiskey into it. I hope that answers that question. It's my thoughts, but yeah, still give it a try. So what if they blended Irish whiskey into it? it still tastes good. Cool. Uh, I think, I don't know if there's any other questions. I feel like the longer I stay, the more that's going <laughs> to, so what, what time do we bail? Um, no, guys, I think, I think we'll call it a quits at that. Thank, thank you all for staying on. Um, if you do have any other questions, um, just get hold of me on Facebook, Stephen Shands, so Stephen with a V, uh, last name S-H-A-N-D, or you can email stephen at leansmaltz.com. Other than that, uh, hopefully later this year, some point next year, I'd love to come over and we'll, we'll do some proper tasting. Um, not that it wasn't proper.